This episode is brought to you by Rasper Mattresses. How's your good night's sleep coming along? Most likely, the answer to that question depends on the size and weight of your sleep mate. The scientists at Rasper Mattresses are into a lot of things that'd be better left unmentioned. But one thing they have found is that if your bed partner is over a mere 9 feet tall and weighs a commensurate number of pounds, you probably find yourself sinking into a deep canyon in the middle of the bed every night. Hope you enjoy spooning! Do you know that the average person rolls over in bed 12 times a night? That's a dozen opportunities for you not to wake up in the morning. No wonder you're exhausted. Well, at Rasper Mattresses, they've solved that problem with their super firm mattresses for the big and oversized. How do they do it? They cut giant mattress-shaped chunks from parking garages in the middle of the night and ship them directly to you. And now our listeners can get a new extra super firm Rasper mattress for only $50. That's right, when you order at their website, just use the promo code RERED, no spaces, and you'll receive a comfy, firm concrete slab delivered to you for next to nothing, plus $5,999 for shipping. And thank you, Rasper Mattresses, for sponsoring the Rereading Wolf podcast. Warning, the following discussion is deliberately riddled with spoilers and unhinged speculation on this nearly 40-year-old book, Gene Wolfe's The Book of the New Sun. You can't read a Gene Wolfe story, you can only reread a Gene Wolfe story. Welcome to Rereading Wolf. We'll abandon the literary artifice that this is the first time you and we have read these books. We're going to try to understand, and that means considering the books as a whole. Hi, I'm James Wynn. And I'm Craig Brewer. Our first Severian annotation episode with Michael Andre Dreesi successfully created a stir. I know that was nice. A little bit of controversy and also a lot of interest, which was cool. So yes. Yeah. Yeah. There was plenty of conversation, counter theorizing, not too much hatred, a little bit outright hatred, just a little bit of skepticism, <laughs> but I have feared that we'd end up, you know, like bald Anders and Talos when the leg people came knocking. So <laughs> there, there was far less outright denouncing of us and the theory than I thought there would be. Yeah, I think we we were both kind of afraid that we'd be stepping out on a limb too much with that one. Yeah, yeah. But I don't know. I don't know. It worked out well. And he does say it. <laughs> but of course, it's a wolf book. So when he comes right out and, and right. says that he that something is very clear to him, <laughs> that's always that's always a oh, red no. flag. But yeah. But no, we had a lot of fun with that. Like we said before, we're going to mention that fairly often here and there, but it's not like our only theory. And I'm, I'm probably, there are aspects of it that I'm still, yeah, well, I'm still questioning <laughs> a lot of stuff about it. Like I do, I totally think that if it's true, it does explain a lot of things, but there are definitely aspects of it that I think you and I, and, and even Michael have slightly different takes on, on what's. Yeah. The, yeah. yeah. I want to actually want to talk about that. The, mm-hmm. there's like three different flavors between the three of us. Seems like, yeah. That, yeah. yeah. You can tell, you can tell it's a, a wolf discussion because there's three people in the room with three different theories about what happened. <laughs> so. Oh, that reminds me, speaking of different theories, I don't know. I, I mentioned to you, we were chatting about a, a game called Dark Souls and I'm not a huge gamer, but it got me interested in people who've gotten really obsessed. And there's another game I used to love called Shadow of the Colossus. Mm-hmm. I don't know oh, if yeah. you've heard of that. One. Okay. Oh, yeah, my so, kids love it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I played that one multiple times, actually. I bought it a few times. So there was a huge conspiracy, not, I won't say conspiracy theory. Part of the reason that people get really into sort of speculating and theorizing about that game is because it's minimalistic in a lot of ways. But there are certain parts of the world that you run around in that aren't really explained very well. And there's one wall in particular that seems like it should lead to something that doesn't. Anyway, there's this wonderful YouTube video that talks about 10 years of this one particular gamer thread where people really kind of did the full on wolf theorizing about it. <laughs> wow. And I'll have to share the links to it because it totally reminded me of the the way people do that with Dark Souls or with especially with that. I'll have to share it online oh, now that I think. Yeah, we'll it. put a link to Just that. Because it feels so wolfian the way that they talk about it. Real quick note before we get started, if you're a little bit sick or put off by the first Severian theory from last time, go ahead and skip past this part where we talk about the email because we're still focused on that from last time and for listener comments and for listener comments, but get on to Baldanders where believe us, it does not dominate the conversation. It's there every now and then, but not a dominant, just a quick little listener note. Mostly the conversations on Facebook and Reddit 
They consisted of theorizing about the implications of the theory or proposing alternate spins. Of course, we don't know the opinions of the people who didn't say anything. Right. <laughs> but I did like it because the discussions kind of reminded me of the old Earth list. I did, really did like that. On Facebook, David Wells suggested that what with the first Severian going back to tinker with his own life and improve it, an alternate outro song for the first Severian episode might be the Beatles getting better. Yeah, it works. Reddit contributor Ubicon had a comment so wide ranging, Craig, and interesting that I can't help but add a link to it in the show notes. One thing he did proffer was a psychoanalytical explanation of Severian's weird, and I think the way it's portrayed is weird, his weird visceral attraction to Thea that he seems barely aware of. Michael sees it much the same way as Ubicon, as everyone knows from the episode, that Thea to Severian is kind of an ideal. All I can say, Ubicon, is that if you never found Severian's relationship to Thea to be peculiar, well, you know, it's unlikely that you're going to see anything but a direct explanation for it to be a solution. You don't need a solution. I think that's part of the reason why people always disagree about the mechanics of how things work and whether something matters or not. Also in the discussions in Reddit and Facebook and the emails, the theories of the mechanics tended to align either with mine or with Michael or with yours. Michael's is that the first Severian is being overwritten as he edits Severian's life. Mine is that the first and second Severian occupy totally separate timelines and only interact to some extent in Yesud, on Zadkiel's ship, mm -hmm. and when you know number one tinkers with number two's timeline. I have extensive specific theories on how that works based on all <laughs> kinds of references in the text and that we're going to get to in about six chapters. We talk about Domnina and wander around the botanical gardens. Uh, Craig, you're tinkering with a combination of the two theories where I think, the, I think there's a good way to put it. Yeah. yeah. Where the timelines of the first and second Severians kind of merge as they go to yes. It, yep. I think we also might differ in whether or not we think first Severian passed the test or not. Mm -hmm. I, I tend to, to be more on the side that he didn't, but is still able to time travel where you, as you and Michael definitely have, and we talked about this in the show where you and Michael feel it very differently. Yeah. yeah. I think you're right that it would, it just seems like a natural thing to do. But then you would lose certain things mm -hmm. uh, that I like symbolically and I don't know. I, 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 and also. And mechanically, too. I mean, sort of like, yeah, how how things happen, how he gets the power to do right, all these exactly. time travel -y things. Yeah. Uh, so on Reddit, Latro of Amber said, quote, the part that really throws me is where Severian says, and so even as I, he who in the final sense was and is myself, unquote. Craig, you took this as a tick on your side, that the Severian's time does merge. And for me, as I said on Reddit, I place more emphasis on the in the final sense, which means to me, mm -hmm. you know, not in every sense. More on Thea and Thecla and Severian's drowning vision on Facebook, Callum McPherson. That is a name I'd steal if it weren't already nailed down. <laughs> Callum suggests that maybe the woman crying is Thecla remembering her own excruciation as Severian describes it being strapped to the table in the examination room. In, uh, in other words, as he writes it, he he can hear her you know, weeping. He says, uh, is it possible? Well, sure, it's possible. Grr. So many things are possible. At Reddit... Um, Avoris 13 proposed his own flavor of your mechanics. In his timeline, First Severian passes the test but fails to bring the new son, he, basically choosing not to. So it is the heroes who go back and tinker with his timeline. I, don't, I, I disagree with that theory, although I, I grant that I cannot demonstrate that it is wrong from the text. Right. Uh, I kind of am fascinated by that one although it means that earth of the new sun is just a totally different story yeah yeah um that that but that's where it gets complicated because their severian is kind of hesitant to do it but he still is full-on going with the plan so on that reading if i'm if i'm following the logic right what would happen would be that the hieros are manipulating severian into wanting to do it in Book of the New Sun, but then Earth right. of the New Sun would basically that be them having succeeded. 
and now we just get a new story, which seems to me like it would kind of make that very separate from New Sun. And I just I I get the sense that the Severian is still Severian. I don't know. I don't know. But it, but it would definitely mean that Earth of the New Sun yes, is a yeah. very separate kind of story and not actually an extension of New Sun. If I'm following how that logic works. On email, uh, Marcus Govea reached out to us about the first Severian episode. Like others, he's not so sure about my belief that Thea was the woman in the tower that first Severian loved. And just to clarify, I think that Thea was the woman in the self. The first Severian planned to help her escape, but she was excruciated on the day of the escape. And that's why Severian, when he's drowning, has that vision of Malrubius looking for him because I think that that him is Thea in First Severian's mind mm-hmm. and that Malrubius is First Severian. Yeah. And, and and of course, all this supposes again that the First Severian ate Thea just as Second Severian ate Thecla okay. and was unified. And that's why Severian speaks to Vodalus as though he's always been a Vodalari. Tight, unified theory. I so love my theory, Craig. I'm in <laughs> love with it. I'm going to marry my theory. Okay, so Marcus uh, Marcus supposes that every time Severian gets lost, it's a hint of a divergence from the first Severian story. So Severian getting lost before meeting Vodalus or before the meeting with Baldanders or the confusion about up and down when he's trying to get to Master Ash's uh, last house. He also proposed his own theory about Earth and the New Sun that is oh so close to yours, Craig. He tentatively mm-hmm. proffered that what if Severian of that sequel is actually the first Severian? That would be beautiful and Wolfian, but <laughs> it would be. Yeah, that that's where it gets hard to figure out because then, right. you know, he remembers everything that our Severian went through. Yeah. Um, particularly on your reading, it's Thecla and not Thea. Well, also, it if the story of, of Earth of the New Sun is the first Severian, then the problem for my reading is that. Gunny knew the first Severian and yeah, that obviously that would count if, unless we yeah. go back to a time loop yeah, that's a good concept, point, yeah. who was that first Severian that she met? If they do get merged <laughs> in some yeah. way, then it could <laughs> Once again. be, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but again, that's, yeah, I will admit this is the one part of it that I don't like, which is where we're working on sort of multiple levels of guessing and speculation and things like that. Not that I, not that I think it's totally wrong, yeah, yeah. but it's, it's just the, I do get that sandpaper feeling of, Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> well, th- the thing is for me, Oh wow. This solves everything. And then I say, Oh, this for so many, we have, we haven't come to a consensus on it at all. Yeah. So now I really like the idea that Severian getting lost is indicative of something. I like it because it does give an explanation to maybe why Severian would claim to have perfect memory, but then have this obvious thing that stands out. And it does seem like something that seems, uh, oh shoot, what's the word? Uh, relentless. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, relentless, but also, um, you know, it stands out so much that he gets lost when he cl- keeps claiming to have perfect memory that maybe this would be a good thing to point out that, yeah, something else is happening here. Mm-hmm. I just I think that would be a really sort of elegant move on Wolf's part to signal something like that. Not sure if it works out. I haven't haven't actually charted it out everywhere, but I'm definitely going to be paying attention. Yeah. From- but th- then he casually proposed uh, something else that. OK, this is actually a spoiler for the book of the short sun. So stop and move ahead a minute if that's a problem. Bop, 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 bop. All right. He proposed that Severian we meet in the Book of the Short Sun is actually the first Severian, and that's why we meet Marin so early and why Severian maybe has Triskali, and I love that, and it makes that encounter so much more meaningful, and I'm adding that as my new favorite unconfirmed theory about the book. Very cool. Anyway, I wish I could go over all the theories, and maybe eventually we will, but the conversation these last two weeks were worth the effort that we put into the episode. Just the, just the conversations alone. Even the dismissive ones. I mean, I, I, I really appreciated people at least sort of speaking up to say that's ridiculous. <laughs> like just because it, it, even if you do feel that way, I, you know, at least 
I don't know. It's nice to sort of throw this stuff out there and then see if something about it sticks, if not. And, and, you know, of course, I mean, if we look back at like all the earth list, how many crazy theories have there been that have been used and discarded? But I feel like mm -hmm. part of the, the whole point is giving them a shot and thinking about them. Yeah. And the skeptic is an important role in that. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, and it shows, yeah. it shows real engagement rather than just saying, yeah, that sounds like it could be true. And then moving mm -hmm. on. It shows yeah. that you're really considering them, which is really cool. Speaking of those, on so let's uh, let's commence with the denunciations, as Gerlois said to the false Thecla. <laughs> on Reddit, in response to Mavoris thirteen, B Sharp Flat says, "I maintain the position that the first Severian exists in a previous cognate universe. This eliminates the need to parse out complex intertwining timelines with the second our Severian. The hero types found a likely candidate in the previous universe and Severians cognate, and they adjusted his life in the next universe to create the god hero they needed. At the end of Citadel, the concept of the first Severian is provided so offhandedly and briefly without supporting evidence that I don't think Wolf meant it to be such a difficult, convoluted mystery to figure out. Moreover, the idea of repeating sequential universe is also presented in the same place in the story with similar offhandedness and brevity. Thus, I think these two concepts were meant to be linked and meant to explain each other. Yeah. Oh, what can I say? <laughs> it could be. And he, I know B sharp flat and I know we know that he has other theories too, about how this world doesn't have a Christ. So it's, it's not actually our universe. The, right. That is Severian's universe. And that does make things, you know, again, he's Lee has a huge theory of his own about it, which is really, I think, you know, even if I don't agree with everything, it's fascinating to hunt it down and look for no, it. No, it's massive. And you can and, always find something that you like in it somewhere. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that's, that's, that's the beauty of it. It sprawls and it's got tentacles, every little place. And I think that that might be a good point, a good place to point out too. There is an early interview with Wolf where he does say that Severian is dealing with multiple, he calls them time cycles. We didn't talk about this in the, in the show last time. But it does seem like something we ought to read. So this is in the the interview with Robert Frazier that's collected in uh, Shadows of the New Sun. Let me find the point exactly. So interviewer says, uh, his talk with the Undine and Claw is very revealing of his past and future. Severian seems to have some control over the immense and powerful forces at work in his life. And Gene says, no direct control. He can be said to have indirect control, if you like, because the forces are responding to his actions in an earlier time cycle. Thus, their actions, quote unquote, now are shaped by his earlier ones. He doesn't go into any detail about that, and he just kind of throws it out there. No, that's... And he just leaves it there. And the problem with time cycles is that you can... You can ask, what does he actually mean by that? Is it metaphorical or is it literal? Mm -hmm. um, but he just throws that out there as if you should have figured that out, <laughs> which is kind of a, a good Wolfian thing to do. Well, that was my problem when I first talked to Michael about this, uh, his theory, the first Severian. And I said, well, wait a minute. That doesn't make any sense because you all, you have these other time cycles, these collapsing and, and uh, expanding universes. Mm -hmm. And but you not but you don't have you, you're trying to do some sort of mini worlds theory and then when i was wondering, oh wait he's this there's it's it's the, it's as if there's a mini worlds theory inside of these collapsing expanding universes mm -hmm. and yes that does get confusing but the more i thought about it for me it began to make sense with some other things that I was seeing. Yep. So yeah, B sharp flat. He, he takes that to that section from the interview to really shore up his idea about this being sort of like multiple universes that repeat over and mm -hmm. over again, but time cycle is a vague word, you know, it can, it's, yeah. it doesn't necessarily mean, you know, it's not a technical term at all, as far as I know. And so it <laughs> could, it could also mean guy living his the life first over and second again. Severian. Yeah. So it, right. it, it gets confusing, right. but just wanted to throw that out there because I don't think we talk about that all, but there is another place where outside of the text, Wolf does talk about Severian right. having indirect control over his life because of knowledge. of time. All to say, I, I fully sympathize with Lee's reading on that. Then also Dr. Evil 1380 said, 
I feel compelled to state that I was never much of a fan of the several Severians theory. I think this theory depends on several timelines, which could hand wave way too many mysterious aspects of Book of the New Sun. I think Severian's story is more of a closed loop. He became the conciliator and Earth of the New Sun because else there would be no ancient cult of the conciliator in the time Severian started his journey. Same for the heroes. They needed to manipulate the past for it to shape them in the end, because if they didn't, they would not exist. My only problem with this is how to tie the Megatherians as alternate mirrors of Zadkiel and company. Yeah, that's, yeah. I mean, that's the that yeah, that's the whole that's the whole conflict, right? Uh, whether a closed loop or a spiral or a spiral. Yeah. In the, I will say this. In the end, I don't think it makes a massive difference how you, whether or not you you specifically have a first Severian or whether you have a closed loop or or something like that. It's more about the mechanics, I think, of how that happened. And you could say that that makes a big difference. Um, and I, you know, I think I, we pointed out sometime in the show about how it it would sort of mix up free will and determinism. And that mm-hmm. might be one way that you could say that it affects the story, whereas a closed time loop could, you know, it's still all Severian just being Severian. I don't know. I, but to me, in the end, as far as the massive difference it makes to how you take the story, I don't really see a difference whether there's just one Severian doing all of this or whether we have the first and second Severian story. I could be wrong, yeah. but it, it's more about sort of difference of emphasis of certain things. But in the end, it's still generally the same story. We're not saying that Severian wasn't the conciliator, right? Like the first right. Severian, no, no, it's yeah. just, it's more about how that happens. Um, exactly. And, and it, but overall the main beats of the story are all still there. And yeah. Earth of the New Sun yeah. still happens. It's just sort of how you get to that point. That's more. Well, it, with a closed loop, there's there's a lot of imagery that you can still tie in to it being a, you know, where where Severian starts is is praying, and he's and he realizes he's praying to himself, and you mm-hmm. can, you can still tie that in and yeah. make that work. All I can say is, you know, for me, <laughs> it was the difference between me just constantly scratching my head about these chapters and mm-hmm. then saying, Oh my gosh, but still uh, then again, a, a contributor on Facebook said most of us has heard the story of how earth of the new sun came to be written as related in multiple interviews. Wolf's editor, David Hartwell felt that the ending of the Citadel of, of the autark was too compressed and needed to be unpacked. Wolf really liked the compressed ending. They eventually agreed to compromise. Wolf would keep the ending of Citadel just as it stood, but also write a further volume that unpacked it. So that's what Earth of the New Sun essentially is, an unpacking of the end of Citadel. This fact has an important implication. Any interpretation of the end of Citadel that markedly differs from what Earth of the New Sun unpacks is probably wrong or at least bears a heavy burden of proof. Well, mm-hmm. <laughs> that's all well said. Yeah. And I agree. I agree. I too. agree. Yeah. It's, it's sort of a matter of how you get to earth of the new sun. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like it's, it's because like we've said, there, there are versions of this idea that are perfectly consistent with, Earth of the New Sun, I mean, the the idea that they somehow merge or something like that. I mean, that's that it happens that way. I think the, the, the most obvious way to take that would be that no, Earth of the New Sun shows that there was one Severian. It's the closed time loop story that goes where, where our Severian goes back in time and, you know, does all the things directly. And I think that's, and, and in other words, what would happen then is that Severian was just wrong about himself or was talking in very imprecise metaphor mm-hmm. talking about first Severian and that's certainly there and I would I would say that that's probably a majority reading yeah no, <laughs> you no, know that's of the, how to take it yeah. that's the most natural reading I think yeah. based on because you we all carry the baggage that we have for time travel stories yeah and yeah and I think yeah. what what we were getting at is just that there's still a lot of loose ends that that, that thinking in terms of first Severian might actually right clarify but no, I still, I, I do agree that if, depending on what, what you think yeah. is simple or needs to be simplified. Well, I do think, actually, I think the thing I, I do like about this and 
it's rare for me to actually advocate for this, but I do think that Michael's theory is arguably the most literal reading of it. But I think so. Yeah. That, that in itself could be an argument against it when you're reading a wolf story. Oh yeah. I, I joked somewhere in the last couple of weeks that the fact that Severian says this is clear to me <laughs> is that's probably the clearest answer that this is not true at all. <laughs> <laughs> like that, the, the fact that he says, this is the, cause that's what he says, right? right. The two things are clear to me. Yeah. That, that right there probably means, <laughs> but, um, but here's one nice thing. Even if you don't like it, even if you don't like this theory, it, it really bugs you. It, it upends, things that you feel are must be true in these stories. I can tell you that this reading has made me so much less paranoid about this <laughs> story. Just as an example, I'm so much less bothered by the fact that the old autark spends his evenings at house Azure working as a pimp and try and being the human resources for all of the Kaibets who work there suddenly. Yeah. You know, okay. That's kind of believable. <laughs> he's he's there for that. He's probably there because he wants to keep an eye on Severian. He knows Rosha because Rosha is his contact inside of the Madison Tower. Okay. All right. That's fine. Uh, I used to agonize over what is Baldander's game in this whole Hyro versus uh, or Arbaya po- political war. And now it's like, Oh, okay. Well, maybe it's not such a big deal anymore. Now that I have this consolidated concept of a person who's pulling the strings and I'm less bothered by the people who I now see as bit players. But yeah, and, and I totally understand the that idea that, you know, Earth of the New Sun just shows that this is all wrong. I, I know where that idea comes from, but I just, I, I'm starting to really think that it's a little more complicated than that. And I will say that there's one textual reason in Earth of the New Sun that still really bugs me and that's the fact that we don't see the end of claw from from our severian's perspective mm-hmm. in earth of the new sun in other words we never see hildegren show up and grab severian you know we never see severian emerge from the tomb right and you know a, a version of himself in this explosion and happened. he never he never builds his mausoleum in the necropolis yeah in fact it, it looks like he he's his mausoleum is going to be built in ushus it seems like, yeah. So those are a couple of things, but particularly it, it strikes me as really odd that the one time you would have a chance to show the same scene from an earlier mm-hmm. book from a different perspective, he doesn't do yeah. it. And that to me is conspicuous, which by the way is the word. I'm <laughs> conspicuous. But, um, but yeah, but because we don't see it and I, lots of people, I mentioned that and I think Mark Aramini had a good response that it, you know, the other thing that we see all the time in Earth of the New Sun is that there are equesters of Severian and that he's dying multiple times and leaving bodies behind. It could have been that that was there. Certainly. Yeah. Absolutely. That's certainly a possibility. But it still strikes me as somehow weird that we never saw that. So that's one. Well, especially if you're going to do a cold closed loop story. Yeah. Yeah, but too, it's, it's so it's just the the general point of if you have a scene where somebody who is a time traveler meets himself, and you see it from one perspective, you should also see it from the other perspective yeah. if it's a closed loop. Right. But we don't. And yeah, certainly he could have just not written it down yeah. in Earth of the New Sun. But I I'm really confused about why he wouldn't have shown that if it wasn't intentionally left out for some other reason. Well, yeah. I, I, I hate to belabor it because as we already spent three hours belaboring it, but I, uh, I do find, I, I find that peculiar for a time loop story and also kind of the Gunny Bungafara story that where Bungafara just doesn't live the life of Gunny. So she doesn't live a time loop. Mm-hmm. So anyway, Nigel, also reached out on Facebook to offer some personal correspondence on Wolf regarding scenes in the Book of the New Sun. The letter he shared from Wolf described a scene of his father driving through a thick fog and one of his friends climbing on the hood of the car to guide them as they creeped along. But it ended with a story about his mother's lack of a sense of direction that might relate to Severian's own tendency to get lost (laughs) at every opportunity. Uh, It goes, quote, about getting thoroughly lost with my mother. Mother had no sense of direction at all. 
blindfold her, take her a block from our house, spin her around and take the blindfold off and she would be utterly lost. One time, I think this was while I was attending Texas A&M, I decided to test her. We had gone to the library downtown. She made a wrong turn, then asked me which way to go. Instead of telling, I professed to be completely lost myself and let her figure it out. Hours later, we were lost in the fog and the dark and in some remote suburb I had never heard of, driving among winding streets lined with private houses and nothing else. Eventually, we hit a main road and I could give her directions. This follows some discussion of... uh, Wolf as a torturer. <laughs> yeah. The fun part about the discussion there was whether this was Wolf being cruel or not, and whether <laughs> it was treating other people as a science experiment or what. But uh, I thought it was just a great story. So I feel bad for his mom. Yeah. I said, suge- yeah, I suggested that Wolf should have told his mom he had a cheese platter at his dorm. <laughs> Nigel followed that up with some consideration of literary instances of judicial torture and execution. Quote, listening recently to your podcast on chapter 12, The Traitor, which incidentally left me in tears, me too, it occurred to me that the only work about judicial torture and execution, which I know for certain Wolf knew and to which he often referred is Gilbert and Sullivan's The Mikado. Yes, it features an executioner. And yes, there is a song all about making the punishment fit the crime. And then he posted the song in full. As always, I'll add a link to the show notes. He also said, quote, I have a vague memory of him referring to encountering the work at quite a young age, maybe recordings of the songs on 78s, but I can't come up with the written mention of this. I really can't prove it. The very next day, Michael Andre Dreese reached out on email to demonstrate that Wolf was familiar with Mikado because in peace, young Den Weir sings a line from it. He added that, quote, regarding judicial torture, he thought a much stronger link could be found in the Judge D Mysteries by Robert Van Gulick, written in English in the late 40s and 50s, apparently for the Chinese and Japanese audiences, which is interesting. Michael says that they also include a scarlet pelerine cape, and that's awesome. But on reflection, Michael considered that there were differences between Master Gerlouise and company and Judge D. He says, quote, the tortures in the Commonwealth have a compartmentalized role in a way that seems similar to that of the European Catholic system, such as the Spanish Inquisition or Hunchback of Notre Dame that Nigel mentioned earlier. He goes on, quote, the torturers do not make tortures to fit the crime. They only unflinchingly do whatever the judges tell them to do. He imagines some sort of administrator selecting from a Manichin catalog of inflictions. He says, The torturers are not asking questions that is done by someone else. They are not investigators. While the torturers are sort of stoic and sort of sacred, they are mainly tools. This is a way of diffusing guilt, but it also provides some sort of check and balance. Uh, Michael says that the, quote, Judge D fails at this model since he combines detective, judge, jury, and, and torturer. Cody Martin's listener comment from last episode is getting listener comments of its own. Now you might remember that he proposed that the mist, the Peltists on the river that saw on the river that night as Severian crossed the bridge was temporarily connected to the scene on the river in Citadel of the Autark when Severian is on the boat with Rosha and Drota in both instances, there appear to be undines in the water. The suggestion is, is that the mist is not just to cover the Undyne's movements, but is related to their time traveling. Well, Anthony Jacona reached out on email with more. He says, you quoted a theory about the river mist being a clue for active time traveling. You forgot to mention that right after Severian escapes death from drowning, he walks up to the gate and describes its fingers of river mist in the first paragraph of shadow. So the time travel is right there from the beginning. 
Also, I think that there is another clue for time travel when the Herodules, whom we know to be traveling uh, backwards in time, take off in their flying saucer from Baldander's castle. So Varian has the impression that they were falling, not flying away. And also when Severian is launched from the river by Juturna, he feels that he was falling. On first reading, I remember being turned over by a particularly powerful wave at the beach when I was a child, not knowing which way was up. However, now there is another sense as a clue to time travel. When Severian returns to the same spot on Ushus, he sees a skull. Is it his own? I think that there are other instances of falling and rising imagery, like when Severian and Burgunda Farah leave Yesid to go to T- Zadkiel's ship. That clues us to time travel. Yeah, I really like that the idea of the mist and the disorientation as mm-hmm. clues to time travel. That seems kind of like we talked before about um, getting lost also being a, a clue to that, but that seems totally right in a lot of ways. Um, thematically, what I have to do is go back and look and see if, yeah, if it, if it actually coincides with all those places, but as sort of markers, I think it's pretty cool. Yeah. I, I like the pointing out of the mist being at the gates as well. Anthony says that he's a Catholic priest and that he quotes, I want to thank you for doing justice to the theological symbolism and imagery in the solar cycle. Well, Anthony, thanks for the compliment. Honestly, I don't think we address it any more than we have to. A listener once asked us to cut back on it, but I have often wondered if I, by detailing what a heretical Christ Severian is, I was killing the joy for people who understand (laughs) Wolf from a more orthodox perspective. So I'm glad that you and I following our nose approach is working, at least, you know, from, from Anthony's point of view. On Reddit, Burnish Black had even more to say about Cody's theory and employs it to claim that the whole scene with Vodalus takes place in the future and they are absconding with Thecla's body. Uh, we've talked about this theory before. Quote, he confirms that River Fog is present the night of Severian's near drowning. He says, the opening of the book draws a parallel between the lock gate and the river fog resembling the mountain paths. The next mention of river fog is it's rolling in from the guile in earnest. Hmm. And it is the subject of the story right before Vodalus's energy weapon discharges. Considering Cody's reading, I am convinced the fog is as much an indicator of potential time slip as up down confusion that Severian experiences directly after Vodalus's weapons discharge, Severian experiences vertigo, quote, the path no longer beneath his feet. Mm-hmm. The world around him dissolving. The scene that follows is the peculiar grave robbing and murder scene. In light of these facts, one could easily make the case that this is a time slip in which the three volunteers, Vodalus's crew, and Severian are subject much like the time slip expressed in the Book of the Short Sun, a time slip that reveals the absconding of Thecla's body by her sister, Hildegrin, and Vodalus. Well, I mean, there's no reason to get this into this too early. We'll have plenty of time for that in Claw the Conciliar. But, I mean, I really want that body to be Thecla or Catherine or an analogy of them so badly. <laughs> But, you know, this theory has to jive with Severian's initial meeting with Vodalus. Yeah. And the thing that I think, too, when we can tie is to see when the claw might be acting if we get those same kinds of uh, disorientations and fogs mm-hmm. and time slips. Yeah. Um, yeah. Would that yeah, that'll be definitely something to keep an eye on. Yeah. Well, you know, it might work, Craig. It might be that what Severian thinks has happened a year and a half ago. For him, it only happened a matter of a week or two for Vodalus. You know, yeah. it might be. We'll just have to consider that when we get there. We did get a couple of five-star reviews. That's right. The first, yeah, the first one's from six months ago, but I didn't see it because it was posted <laughs> in the UK Apple Podcasts. Get your act together, Apple. The title 
of this, the first one is uh, Earth of the New Fun. Great title. And it's from Ghost on the Moor, whose pleasant accent I do believe I recognize, <laughs> but which but which I shan't attempt to duplicate whilst I read it. It goes, Gene Wolfe enthusiast Craig Brewer and James Wynn reread Wolfe's four-volume masterpiece, The Book of the New Sun. This splendid podcast is aimed squarely at those who have already read the book and want to know more about the meaning and significance of the events it describes. Each episode tackles a separate chapter, and Brewer and Wynn's discussion is both scholarly and entertaining, while always remaining thoroughly accessible. They take particular delight in examining the theories which readers have come up with to explain what is going on in the story, reveling in both their insights and absurdities. Plenty of information and food for thought here for all lovers of wolf fiction. That's cool. And uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I have to say. And also, also just posted by uh, Jet Portal, a review titled Fireside of the New Sun. Quote, I have read Book of the New Sun once, and now I am rereading it along with the show. Hosts James and Craig offer clarity to Wolf and this masterwork without ruining its wonderful opacity and mysterious appeal. Honestly, though, Jet Portal, it's not from lack of trying that we're not ruining its wonderful opacity <laughs> and mysterious appeal. But that evil Wolf continues to defeat us. He goes on. The fact that the episodes are over an hour means that I can reread Book of the New Sun concurrently with other books, yet I'm not in danger of losing my place because their discussions pull from past episodes and future chapters constantly, an approach I find especially appropriate for such a complex interwoven story. The hosts have pleasant voices and mannerisms I don't in anticipate tiring up. <laughs> <That's good. laughs> well, you're half there, Jet Portal. You're half there. <laughs> One of us does have a very pleasant voice. Imagine if you were us, though. We have to listen yeah. to twice as much of us. <laughs> well, Zavarian has been walking all night, Craig, so let's get him into a hotel where he can finally you know, get a load Get on. a little rest. I bet all his yep. own. <laughs> Chapter 15, Baldanders. I got to say, it makes me happy to actually say that word out loud. <laughs> You've been wanting. <laughs> I've, I've been waiting for a long time to get out of the tower. Not because I dislike the tower, but I just love once Severian gets out into the world because strange things start happening so quickly. Yeah, I know that you have felt marooned in the swamps of Nessus. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So Severian, as you recall, finishes crossing the bridge to the Western side. And once you get over there, Nessus looks really different from the East side at every street corner is a flambeau lighting it up. There's a lot of traffic coaches and carts. I don't know how there can be so much traffic on the bridge from the Western side and none on the Eastern side. Perhaps all the traffic was going North of that bridge. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. I'm not sure. If, yeah. Cause thinking about, the direction of where mm -hmm. things are and what they are. Yeah. The same kind of thing question I have when they actually leave the gates later on, if travel is so looked down on in the Commonwealth, why is there a flood of people leaving the city at this point? Where are they all <laughs> yeah. going? You know, that's one question I have that I don't, I don't know if there's a good answer, but, yeah. but it always bugs me. Well, you know, um, Talos is going to mention that when they're touring, they just, they went down South mm -hmm. uh, on the East side and then they turn around and go North to on the Western side. Yeah. So perhaps, yeah, maybe it's all on these, that all the traffic is coming from North of the bridge. Yeah. Before he left the bridge, he got recommendations for hotels. He's walking along, looking for a sign of the inn that he's going to stay at his exhaustion from walking for what, 15 hours or so is finally starting to hit him. But the streets are just getting darker. He says, somewhere I must have taken a wrong turn. This is different, Craig, I think, than getting lost. This is a failure to follow simple directions. So <laughs> yeah. is this a manipulation? Are we, we were talking about the first variant in the last episode. 
could the first variant have, you know, draped a blanket over a street sign to get him to the one with Talos <laughs> and Bald Anders? It's certainly possible. Um, lots of things in the book do happen with people following certain paths mm -hmm. and missing certain ways of walking. So it could be that there's something signal by that. You know, I, it certainly seems like that's a place to look if you're going to yeah. try and find that thing here. Um, at the same time, it's also his first time out wandering around and he certainly could get distracted. Well, the thing is that there are actually a whole series of choices that would be necessary to get Severian into Baldander's bed. And mm -hmm. yet, you know, it was a significant coincidence that Severian yep. ends up in the same bed as the previous potential candidate for the new son. So anyway, now what would be the point in turning around? He just keeps walking basically north. He decides, I might be lost, but I'm still moving closer to Thrax. Finally, he comes to a small inn, but they are serving food. He walks in the door and drops into the nearest chair. He props his sword on end between his legs. He sits there, just resting. But pretty soon, three men drinking in a corner get up and leave. Apparently, no one wants to be in a room with a Carnifex. So the proprietor, an old man, comes over and asks what he's there for. He wants a room. Sorry, baby Jesus, no room at the end. <laughs> oh, well, Severian says he, he doesn't have money anyway. Well, then you have to leave. Not yet. I'm too tired. This is a common trick the journeyman torturers have taught Severian to get a free room. He sort of begs for food, too. So one thing I know, this seems weird. Um, and I remember feeling weird. I don't know. remember if it was the very first time. But I do remember reading this and being like, okay, here's a... I still thought of him as a kid, sort of out of his own for the first time. And all of a sudden, he's sort of... I'm going to con this guy and throw my weight around. And I was mm -hmm. like, that's sort of... Is that out of character? Rereading it, I don't think so. Like, Severian has never come across as shy and confused when he actually has to act right mm -hmm. there, there's so few moments where he hesitates in what he needs to do that actually doing this even though he knows nothing about the world around him that's more a sign of his character i feel like that he you know i've heard this trick i'm gonna try it like he's not a shy person and i'm just thinking of other times where people might have commented that it either seems unrealistic or it makes severian seem way too cocky somehow to do this on his first day out. But uh, yeah, I don't think so. I think it's more intentionally Wolf saying, no, check out how, <laughs> you know, how sort of self-assured in certain ways this kid is. Well, he doesn't have to, he knows he doesn't have to do much. All he has to do is stay there and not leave. Mm -hmm. and that's the whole, that's the, the idea of the plan. And he's done this sort of thing at the Guile too, even yeah. when he was younger. They would go and they, they want a place. They sit, go there, they sit down, and eventually everyone leaves. Exactly. And two, one of the first things he says in the first chapter was how much he sort of respected Drada for, was it Drada? Oh, shoot. I forgot. It was Drada and Roach, who you know, cons <laughs> the, the, the guy. I'm, I'm totally playing the, my memory of the, getting the two of those confused is just it's a bad Roach. experience. I think it's Roach, but... Yeah. Um, but, you know, he, he admires that he, you know, came up with this sort of way to manipulate the guy into getting him in there. So, yeah, right. so it's, it's a thing that they do. And, and he's used to dealing with people too. It's not like he doesn't deal with people, people who are trying to manipulate him, people threaten him, people a good point. who wheedle him, people who are desperate. He's used to dealing with people and making people feel uncomfortable. It's a great point. Yep. The proprietor suggests that he'll call the city guard and throw him out. But from his tone, Severian guesses that this is a bluff, and he calls him on it. There are still five other men in the room, but no one looks Severian in the eye, and pretty soon, two of them leave. The proprietor brings a fish that's gone bad and a slice of stale bread. Eat this and go. Severian eats it and asks where he can sleep. No rooms, I told you. Severian is too tired to go anywhere. He knows that getting a room requires just sticking around. He says he'll just sleep in the chair then. You're not likely to have more trade tonight anyway. The proprietor tells him, okay, just wait. And he goes into another room and he talks to a woman. And Severian actually does fall asleep in that chair. The old man shakes him awake. Is Severian willing to sleep in three to a bed? Who am I sleeping with? Two optimates. I think this means something like, 
two gentlemen. Mm-hmm. Quote, very nice men traveling together. The woman says something from the kitchen. The old man says, did you hear that? One of them's not even come in yet. At this time at night, he probably won't come at all. There'll be just two of you. The men won't complain because they're behind on their rent. They paid for one night and this is the third. Severian realizes that the innkeeper had opted that since he couldn't get rid of this Carnifex, he'll use them to get rid of some other unwelcome guests. Given that one of the guests is Baldanders, a rageaholic giant, he probably didn't (laughs) want to confront them directly. One nice thing about this, too, is that the innkeeper, even though being a little intimidated by Severian, is also manipulating him and, Mm -hmm. well, more, I guess, probably more manipulating Baldanders and Talos and sort of using the opportunity. But it's just kind of a cool little twist here where Severian's, you know, conning the guy and the guy is also kind of in on a con, too. I mean, they're small time cons, but but still there's there's manipulation of, you know, motivation and outcome going on in both sides. And they're both using each other for different things. So Severian didn't mind this arrangement at all, since if the other guests leave, he'll get the whole room for himself. He follows the innkeeper up a, quote, crooked stair. The door to the room isn't locked, but the place is dark as a tomb. One thing before we get into the the room itself, one thing I think is kind of cool to point out is that this is Severian's, what, second day out into the larger world. And there is kind of a pattern here when we're thinking about genre books of, you know, the hero stopping in an inn and getting a little glimpse of the wider world. And getting a quest. And getting a quest. Yeah, I mean, exactly. That's, I mean, if this is Brie in a certain sense, this is, you know, we're kind of going to get an anti Aragorn, I guess, with Talos and Baldanders, right? Like we find someone who's a mysterious stranger. Uh, they turn out not to be the hidden king, but actually a hidden monster in certain ways. <laughs> but I mean, this is one of those great sort of moments where he's totally playing the standard fantasy novel trick. Right? Yeah, yeah um, definitely. And, and it's def- we just it's just fun to mention that yeah he's going to put this here but it again like everything else is going to go in a weird way where all of a sudden instead of talking to the fun barkeep and learning about the world he's forced to sleep in a bed with a giant and it just yeah totally weird. Well, I don't know if you saw the the second big uh, network series that Michael J. Straczynski uh, came out with. He he had just had a big success with Babylon Five, and so he got a deal for another uh, kind of science fiction. Uh, series, science fantasy series. And it's essentially, it, even though it's aliens and other people, it's essentially, you know, a wizard, a knight, mm-hmm. an elf, you know, a, a rogue, you know, that kind of thing. So the wizard and the knight uh, descend on this planet. And the first thing they do is they go to a, a little saloon. And he says, well, what do we do now? And the wizard says, we wait. And says, what do we wait for? Something to happen. <laughs> well, what if nothing happens? Something always happens. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Yeah, and this feels like that. It definitely feels like that. The room to the door isn't locked, but the place is dark as a tomb. Severian hears heavy breathing. The innkeeper refers to Baldanders as Goodman rather than Sir, revealing that he lied about them being optimists. Mm-hmm. Goodman, what do you call yourself? Baldy? Baldanders? I brought company for you. If you won't pay your rate, you'll have to take on borders. Here, Master Carnifex, I'll make you a light. He has a punk that's a bit of soft, fungusy wood. You can flame, put a flame to it, and it'll slow burn for a while to light candles or the fireplace. So he blows on it to make it burn red hot and lights a short candle. The room is small. The only furniture is a bed, but in the bed is the largest man Severian has ever seen. He's laying on his side, facing the other way. His legs are curled up so they won't hang off the foot of the bed. He's under the covers now, but we'll soon see that his legs are curled up almost to his chin. Severian says that Bald Anders was not just exultant tall. He's large enough to be called a giant. Mm-hmm. So, well, let's talk about his size for a minute. I know we don't, we don't actually see him yet, but how tall do you picture Bald Anders? I'm curious. How tall? Well, he is tall, but here's something I picked up this time. Mm -hmm. He's about three and a half feet wide at the shoulders. And that suggests to me that he's not 
fat. I always think of him as being very heavy set, mm-hmm. but he's not. He's he's kind of lean. He's like a giant fullback. Yeah, that's usually how I've pictured him. I know other people. Um, I've seen some you know fan art and stuff like that to make him seem yeah really bulky. I've always thought of him as you know bit of like a weightlifter you know uh, mm-hmm. honestly more like an athletic kind of form is what i right. think but really big um but i'm gonna guess nine feet maybe that's around the, the height i was thinking because i i tried to he's got a fit in a in a sort of standard bed right mm-hmm. um and we know an exultant is around seven feet ish right is that around what we decided I yeah, seven and a half feet, seven, seven half. feet, depending on who they are, yeah. Right, and so Baldanders has to be taller than that, but he also can't be, you know, stupid tall, right? He's got to right. be, he still has to be able to function in this world. It's not like, in, and Wolf's aware of that, because, of course, when we see Juturna come up out of the water, you know, she literally starts bleeding and can't control, you know, she, right. she's literally too big to move outside of the water. Um, so he hasn't gotten to that point yet. So, yeah, I'm trying to, I always try to imagine nine or 10 feet. Um, And it's kind of a cool size because I think a lot of times when we imagine giants, we either think of them as, you know, super big, like Jack and the Beanstalk type Mm -hmm. giant, um, or we think that people just mean a really big person. But the way Wolf has his giants, like here and also in Wizard Knight, the giants are in that just slightly unrealistic size which <laughs> yeah. i think is so cool because it's kind of hard to imagine but also um it puts you right at the edge of plausibility right and i just really like that trick i just i just think that's really a fun thing to do so yeah and so he's got to be tall enough to fit in the bed with his legs yeah curled up right. so the innkeep is still trying to wake him up aren't you going to wake goodman Baldanders and see who your lodge mate might be <laughs> Zavarian just wants to go to bed, but the innkeeper wants to wake Bald Anders up so he can see who he has to room with. Zavarian has to force him out of the room. He sits down on the bed and he removes his boots and socks. His feet are blistered. He spreads his cloak on the bedspread. He calls it a counterpane. He just sleeps with his pants and belt. Bald Anders is sleeping in his clothes. He blows out the candle and lies down for the first time that he can remember outside of the Manachin Tower. It's the morning of the 14th day, exactly two weeks since the Feast of Holy Catherine. He lies down with Terminus S between them, which makes me think of the story of Tristan and Isolde. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's Isolde, what I was going to mention. Yeah, yeah, Isolde's husband, Mark, is always trying to catch them, you know, at the in the very act, cheating on him which they totally were. He finds them together, sleeping in the woods, fully clothed with a sword between them. And so he decides he was mistaken about the whole thing. So I guess that makes Talos Mark, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that that trope of lying with a a sword between you, there are a lot of versions of um, the King Arthur story that the way that he signals to Guinevere and Lancelot that he knows them is that he finds them sleeping and then lays... Excalibur between them. Um, I think that was even in the movie Excalibur. I think he lays the sword between them, and that's how. Um, oh, I think uh, I missed he, that. Uh, or maybe he stabs it in the ground between them. I think that. Oh yeah, yeah, is. that's what he does. Yeah, because because Lancelot wakes up and he he like cuts himself on the sword. Yeah. Um, but in there are certain versions of it too, where yeah, he lays the sword between them. Uh, I remember two in particular that I had to read one time that that that's the way he sort of signals to him. So the sword between people, like in the Tristan and Zolt story, it's more a mark of chastity. But in some of the King Arthur stories, it's more a sign of being found out um, and, right. and being, you know, where your guilt is let known. And I think that one's kind of cool because if you take that approach to it, then it's more like. Not exactly foreshadowing, but it, it fits better with the fact that Severian's going to find out that there's some bad stuff about Bald Anders later on. Yeah. Now, it's oft noted that this scene is reminiscent of the scene in Moby Dick, where Ishmael has to share a bed with mm-hmm. Queequeg, a cannibal of the Pacific Islands. But the note here that as Wolf has respun it, Severian is not Ishmael. Bald Anders is. Severian is the uh, headhunter. That's true. That's true. I was thinking, you know, about the lake people, but Baldanders, of course, is not of the Lake Diaturna people. He 
his mm. brother <laughs> on the <laughs> other side of them not being very nice to them at all but yeah that that works yeah he's definitely the headhunter severian is yeah yeah so i usually look for ways that wolf has woven these stories into his own as a clue to this complicated background story that wolf has created around these characters that is taking place just outside of the reader's eyesight so i ask myself who in this story is ahab dr talos well, then who's the white whale? Abia? How would Talos be hunting Abia? Does Talos have more agency in all this than we've come to expect? Perhaps Talos is Starbuck and someone else is Ahab. In Moby Dick, the thing about Ahab is that he spends most of his time frustratingly off camera. Is there a connection between Baldander's plan and Hathor? This is the way I read these things. I, I don't know what all this means, if anything. <laughs> I like it, though, because I'm sitting here trying to think, yeah, what, who would Ahab and the whale be? In, and it depends, too. Yeah, it's sort of like who is uh, is this at that moment? Are, are we thinking of Baldander's story more on his side? Are we thinking of Severian's story? You know, who's? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. OK. Yeah, I don't have a good answer for that either. But I <laughs> like I like the question. I like it a lot. So uh, let's talk about the name. Bald Anders. Yep. Everyone talks about Borges' book of imaginary mm -hmm. beings and the 17th century Sim Simplicius Simplicimus. Mm -hmm. I own both these books. The Borges book is great. The German novel is, you know, what it is. You even put the Borges book is on Facebook when you did the like the the books. That yeah, <laughs> did you the most? His book of imaginary beings was one of your seven, right? Is it? Seven? Yeah, 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 yeah. You had you gave me a Facebook challenge to yeah. post seven <laughs> books, and that was yeah, that was one of them. I knew you'd get a kick out of that. But I'll tell you something: if there's a clue to Baldanders in either of those books, I missed it. But the creature Baldanders goes back further. Mm -hmm. Um. Hans Sachs wrote uh, Simplicius Simplicimus, and he invented Baldanders for a 16th century in the 16th century, and described a list in a book that of descriptions of imaginary creatures. Baldanders is just two German words, soon another. According to Sachs, he was symbolic for the continual change in nature and society. He demonstrated how it was vital to understand the common world from other people's perspective. That's a valuable sentiment, but it tells me nothing about Bald Anders. <laughs> but Bald Anders has an older pedigree. Socks was inspired by reading the description of Proteus in the Odyssey, as Borges mentions in the Book of Imaginary Beings. So, you know, now we're getting somewhere. Proteus the old man of the sea, an immortal on the island of Pharaohs off the coast of Egypt. He is Poseidon's head man, and he knows every inch of ground all over the bottom of the sea. If you can catch him, he can answer any question you ask, but first he'll try to wriggle away by changing into any form of animal and water and fire. Eventually, he'll begin to talk and change back to his normal form. When Agamemnon's brother Menelaus caught him, he changed into a lion, a huge serpent, a leopard, a boar, running water, then a tree. How Menelaus held on when Proteus turned into running water, you know, I don't know. His name means firstborn, and Baldanders and Severian are maybe a little bit like Esau and Jacob. Baldanders was potentially going to bring the new son, and then voila, I went to Severian. Yeah, I actually like that a lot. And the idea of the firstborn works in a certain way, too. If um, we think about how the Hyraduls are helping Baldanders first, and then maybe they see, you know, okay, Baldanders isn't the way to go, that the, the way he's doing something, that's not going to lead to, you know, the development of humanity. And so they switch over to Severian as sort of the next version. Mm -hmm. Um and I like that. There's also, there's something about that too that goes with my Curiositas Earthus that I'll, I'll get to later. Um, and I'm just going to put a pin in that, as they say, <laughs> and if I can remember it 
later when we we talk about it. But the other thing I wanted to mention too is that sometimes in the depictions of Baldanders, he's a hodgepodge of, like they said, of different things. Like having, I know the, the sort of gen- general thing that you'll see if you look him up on the internet is that he has like one goat leg and something mm-hmm. like that, um, and that fits with the Frankenstein motif right sure. it's about how being you know cobbled together of different things and talos even says you know in sort of lictor severian sees the prisoners and he's like why do we why does baldinders keep all these prisoners here and talos is like yeah spare parts you know <laughs> um and so it could literally kind of be that too that when he's this mix of, of changing things there is a bit of that that frankenstein cobbled together feel to it but um we know that Wolf did flat out say that he got the name from Borges. Mm-hmm. So, um, and that's in, is that in, that's in Castle of the Otter or is it in an interview? Shoot, I can't actually remember um, at this point. But he does just come right out and say that, that the name specifically comes from Borges. But that doesn't mean. That's where he originally encountered. Right. But that, that means nothing about, the, that certainly doesn't rule out all the other stuff about Proteus being in there. And I, there is so much about Baldenders when we really find out what he is, um, that this sort of idea of someone trying to be self-made or, you know, the original or, or trying to to, you know, do things by yourself, which go back so much to the Proteus legend really fit and really mm-hmm. work. So yeah, definitely think there's something to that. Okay. Bald Anders is asleep. He's dreaming though. In his sleep, he's having a conversation with someone. Bald Anders says, never bald Anders. You strike off tomorrow. Then Severian says the tone was so deep and resonant, almost like the lowest notes of an organ that I was not certain at all what the meaning of the word had been, or even if it had been a word at all. But of course, you know, he's answering the innkeeper after the fact. But Severian thinks that Baldanders is talking to him. When Baldanders says, never, Severian answers, what did you say? Baldanders. I know, the innkeeper told me, I'm Severian. You strike off. You heard us when we came in then. I thought you were asleep. Yes, I'm headsman. I, yes, I'm a headsman, but you need not fear me. I only do what I need to do now. Tomorrow, then. Yes, tomorrow will be time enough for us to meet and talk. So Severian drifts off and starts to dream. He says, It may have been that Baldander's words, too, were a dream, yet I do not think so. And if they were, it was a different dream which kind of is seems to be like wolf suggesting that there is something else going on. Mm-hmm. It could work with the if with the innkeeper's answers, but maybe he really is bargaining. In which case, tomorrow then is sounds like he's agreeing to do something the next day. And and, and of course, as Severian says, his words were a different dream, a dream that Bald Anders was having. Now we come to Severian's dream. Okay, we're going to go through the dream here, but we're not going to stop too much. We want to get a lot of things sort of on the table so that we can come back and really talk about, put a lot of things together. Yeah, we. I think we need to get all this stuff under our belts. Yeah, there's a lot of a lot of moving parts in this dream. It's Mm -hmm. not something that you can easily just go. And this means this, and this means this. Right. Yeah. So Severian's dream. He's riding a huge leather winged being, not an animal, mind you, a being. Her beak was the beak of an ibis, her face the face of a hag, and her head was a mitre of bone. Uh, It's a pterodactyl. It's the kind of beast that the Autarch's personal guard uses. And this is the time of, you know, heavy metal covers, right? This is the (laughs) 80s. And so somebody, you know, hanging on to, uh, you know. A pterodactyl, right? They are equiposed between clouds and ground. He says the sky is lowering and the ground is twilight. So, you know, it's sunset. The winged being is gliding like a vulture, though. Only once does she flap her wings. They're flying into the setting sun. So they are flying west, but they are not actually getting close to it. Severian says, quote, it seemed we matched the speed of Earth. So he has this idea of that the earth is passing below them, like 
someone walking on an escalator in the opposite direction. So he doesn't move despite his constant movement forward. So, but you know, I guess he must be going a hundred miles an hour. Now, the features just below him change. At first, he thinks it's a desert. There are no cities, woods, or fields on it, just blackened purple in color, featureless and nearly static. The muscles of the being he's riding get tense, and she flaps her wings three times at once. Now he sees what he's coming to is the ocean. If Nessus is Buenos Aires, it's, you know, maybe the Pacific Ocean. He calls it the World River Ouroboros, cradling Earth. In ancient times, civilizations that considered the Earth to be flat had this concept of a flat disk surrounded by a single river called ocean. That's what the Greeks called it. So the spherical sky spun around them. Mm -hmm. The stars and the sun and the moon were pinned to the inner surface of the sphere. And when the stars or the sun set, in the horizon, they sank below the sea. They literally went into the underworld. Severian looks behind him in the east and, quote, the country of humankind swallowed in the night. He's the sailor that sailed after the sun. <laughs> now everywhere is water all around them. Finally, the being turns around to look at him. As they look at each other, they communicate telepathically. The pterodactyl says, um, you dream. But were you to wake from your waking, I would be there. So she's saying that, I guess, this is a dream, but it's really happening in a sense. I think so. And But the phrasing there of, if you were to wake from your waking, I would be there. That's, that's the confusing part mm -hmm. of the phrase, right? Like if you are to wake up from waking up, I would be there. Which, a couple ways you could read that. I mean, to me the grammar almost makes it say like, you know, this dream is part of awaking. Like this dream is you starting to, you're like your first glimpse of something mm -hmm. that you need to understand. And so this, you know, even your dreams are even part of learning something and, and, you know, starting right. that quest as it were. So in other words, if you were to, to go further and really start working on the quest, then I will be there. That's one way to, to think about it. The, the most straightforward thing is, yeah, you know, if you woke up, I'd, I'd be there, that this would be real and it's not just a dream. I think that's the basic idea. But wake from your waking, that's kind of a platonic idea again, mm -hmm. where this- There's your Gnostic the life right there. Is yeah. just, right. This world is just a dream itself and we need to wake from it. But to, to go with the platonic and the Gnostic there, it's it goes back to the idea too that the dream isn't just falseness, right? The dream is a lower level of understanding. Mm -hmm. And, you know, your waking is sort of a continual process of understanding the, the truer meaning of whatever's going on. Right. And so it's kind of like saying, you know, the opposite of that would be like, you no, know, dreams are false and, you know, and waking is true. But in right. this, you know, dreams can be real. You know, with my new understanding of the first Severian, I have to wonder if this happened to the first Severian. Did he ride a pterodactyl over the Pacific? Now the pterodactyl tips her wings and they dive into the sea. As soon as he hits the water, Severian wakes up with a start. He makes sure Terminus Est is still there and then he falls back to sleep. Now he's under the water, but he can breathe. He has no probably problem seeing in the water, which is perfectly translucent. Here, under the water, there are the shapes of giant creatures, hundreds of times the size of people. Some look like ships. Some look like clouds. One was a giant head, no body. Another has a hundred heads. This is the civilization of the Megatherians. It's also kind of a direct reference to Tale of the Student and His Son, right? Where there is a giant ship with a giant head. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that, yeah, I mean, there's some, there's some almost literalness to what we're going to see later. Right. Here below the water, it's again like he's floating in the air. He can see a country of sand below him. There's a sunken palace below him that's bigger than the citadel, ruined and roofless. In the palace garden, there are sponges and sea anemones and other beautiful things that he couldn't identify. But there are huge white figures moving through the palace. White as leprosy. 
Severian, you're one to talk. <laughs> There's also, though, here's your Moby Dick, maybe, right? Like the giant mm. white thing. Um, yeah. And then to call it white as leprosy. I mean, the whale is not leprous, but the whale is dangerous. And the, right. the whale is, you know, destructive and infects Ahab in all kinds of ways. Well, now they look up at him. They're massive undines like Jaterna. He recognizes them as being like the one that he encountered in the Gaio. They're women, ghastly white, naked, hair that is light green, he says, seafoam green. Their eyes are, he says, eyes of coral, but I assume that means the color of coral, pinkish, I guess, maybe. So part of their transformation has been to make them albino. Their teeth are white and pointy. As long as a finger, their fingers are webbed as long as Severian's whole arm. He's sinking, I guess, because he says, laughing, they watched me fall. He says, their laughter came bubbling up to me. He sinks near them and their hands reach up to me and stroke me as a mother strokes her child. They gather round him and he's only doll size compared to them. He says, who are you and what do you do here? They say, we're the brides of Abaya, the sweethearts and playthings, the toys and valentines of Abaya. The land could not hold us. Our breasts are battering rams. Our buttocks would break the backs of bulls. Here we feed, floating and growing, until we are large enough to mate with Abaya, who will one day devour the continents. And who am I? Well, we will show you. So one takes both his hands and they all swim with him through the garden. Now they stop and everyone sinks to the seafloor. So here in this undersea garden is a low wall and on the wall is a puppet show stage and curtain. Wolf loves puppet references. (laughs) He has a whole famous short story about a science fantastic puppet theater the Book of the Short Sun is loaded with Pinocchio references. The Book of the New Sun has Pinocchio references, as uh, as others have mentioned, particularly Michael. Now, between the curtains, Severian sees the following. At once, there appeared the tiny figure of a man of sticks. His limbs were twigs, still showing bark and green bud. His body is a branch, a quarter span of branch. That's thumb sized, I think. And the branch is as thick as a thumb. His head is just a knot on that branch with the natural grain of the wood forming his eyes and mouth. The little man of sticks carries a little club and he waves it threateningly at everyone and strikes the stage with it. The puppet moves realistically. Now there's a boy puppet armed with a sword. The puppet is not this puppet is not crudely put together like the other one. It's perfect. It might be a real child, only mouse sized. Both figures bow to the audience and then they fight elegantly, elaborately, stabbing, parrying, dodging. The wood figure's cudgel and the boy's sword are broken at last. The wood figure collapses. The boy walks over to it, but then the wooden figure floats up from the stage. Turning limply and lazily, it rose until it vanished from sight, leaving behind the boy. Then he hears a flourish of toy trumpets. Severian postulates that it was really the squeaking of cartwheels on the street outside. And then he wakes up. Okay, so that is probably one of the stranger things that anyone (laughs) will have encountered yet while reading uh, book the new sun but yeah we'll start we're only getting are... started <laughs> oh yeah oh yeah exactly but yeah so is it one dream or two dreams that's where maybe we could start talking about it it's broken you up know, it's broken up but it seems like this he i mean he wakes up when he when they hit the water mm-hmm. and then he's under the water and there's another way you could do it too because the first part of the this if it is a second dream still seems like part of the first dream in a certain sense but then when he gets to the puppet show that seems like it goes in a totally different direction 
right? Like, like it's sort of self-consistent. Like the story is kind of consistent when he's like, now I'm, you know, I'm flying over the water. Now I'm in the water. And there are these water creatures that have some connection to the story we've read so far. But then once you get to the puppet show, you're just in surreal land. You're right. You're just like, right. Right. So I feel like the easy part of the dream is the last bit and it not easy when you first read it, of course, but when you know how the relationship between Baldanders and Severian is eventually is going to play out, what it's showing you is a quick little summary of what happens in sort of the Lictor when Severian has to finally confront Baldanders and, and um, they fight and Terminus S gets broken. Well, that is true, mm-hmm. but I'm not so sure. That's what right. Right. I mean, that's what I think <laughs> when you first read it that and you you or when you first reread it, I guess that's a connection. So it, it certainly seems like that's there. Um, but it, why would he do that? Like why the point to me is like, why would he just sort of say that that's coming mm-hmm. later? Is it just is it just there just to show sort of what's happening in the future? Well, maybe if so, how does very know the future? What's going on here? Um, it doesn't happen. Here's the thing. Let's talk about two, a couple things. First of all. Severian in this dream says, who am I? Mm-hmm. That is a heads up, I think, <laughs> that the person in this dream is not who we, the observer, think it is. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's Severian. Secondly, the end of the story of where Severian, with his sword, defeats Baldanders, it doesn't end this way. Right. Baldanders doesn't ascend to the sky. Right. He right. dives to the bottom to of the, the bottom sea. Of the sea. Mm-hmm. It, it, it goes entirely different. It is Severian who is supposed to ascend. Yep. So if I was going to guess, I would say that this is not Severian's dream. We're going to get another hint that this is not Severian's dream because I think that what this is saying and what they want is that Baldanders is supposed to, in some way, make Severian unready to complete the test when he ascends. He will ascend to Yesid, but he will fail the test. Hmm, okay. I think that is the mission that they've set out for him. And why he wants that, I don't know. You know, just I, I, he's serving a buy, I guess. So on that, would this be would this dream be sent by Abaya? Do you think? Or yes, and okay. we'll get another. Maybe we should wait and and see. We'll get some more stuff about this dream coming up. All right. So someone comes into the room and wakes Severian up. It's Doctor Talos, the other guest in the room. He never sleeps here though, because you know he's a mechanical person, a chemical person, so to speak. Let's call him a chem for short. <laughs> So Severian describes Talos as a small, brisk man with fiery red hair, well-dressed, flamboyantly dressed. His teeth are gold when he smiles. He has delicate, well-cared-for hands, or at least that's one of them. He sees Severian is awake, and so he throws back the shutters, red sunlight streaming in. Red sun, green moon. Remember that even at high noon, the world is in perpetual twilight. Mm -hmm. So this is probably not as jarring as we'd assume, but perhaps, you know, people's eyes have adjusted to the gloom. (laughs) So, you know, it is for them. Talos says, my partner sleeps soundly always. His snoring didn't deafen you. I slept well myself. And if he snored, I didn't hear him. Talos seems to like that, although Severian says he shows gold teeth when he smiles. But later we're told that he essentially makes his expressions through delicate motions of his head and body, giving him, quote, an amazing and realistic appearance of vivacity. But apparently he can't at least show teeth. (laughs) Incidentally, Severian will later describe Talos as looking like a stuffed fox or Mm -hmm a fox's face on a wall. I don't understand the association with foxes. It bothers me in the same way that Thea's constant association with doves bothers me. Oh, I got some ideas about that. Oh, good. Oh, I'm so glad to hear that. (laughs) But yeah, the whole thing about the snoring though, like I feel like that's a little 
hint. Like when you first read it, you could think, oh, he's just, you know, Severian was really tired. So he was so tired, he slept through a giant snoring. But I think it's actually meant to signal something else that maybe while all this dreaming was going on, Severian was possibly in some kind of trance, like held under the thrall of something. Mm -hmm. Um, That makes more sense to me. Uh, because otherwise it doesn't seem like the kind of thing that Wolf would really spend a whole lot of time. Well, here's something he does about. say. Um, Talos says he does snore. Snore, that is. He says he snores to shake earth, I assure you. Happy you got your rest. All right. So the conciliator's goal, of course, is to flood the earth and bring renewal. However, the undines in the dream said that the goal of Abaya is to consume the continents. Mm -hmm. We've made a lot of Severian destroying the world, but is there a sense that the normal people of earth are going to be wiped out anyway, that Abaya is going to cause an earthquake that will sink the continents into the oceans. So when Talos says that Baldander snores to shake earth, you know, it's similar. We never see that end. That, <laughs> but then yeah. at this point, we never see Severian's end either. But you know, that's something I was thinking this time around. So Talos offers his hand and introduces himself. Severian does the same. And finally, he introduces himself as Dr. Talos. And Yes. And, he, and Severian introduces himself as the journeyman Severian. So we can talk about Talos's name for just a minute. Um, if you are familiar with Greek mythology and stories, Talos is a fake man. A Talos is basically like a proto, not robot, but kind of like a golem. Yeah, he's he was built by... Hephaestus. Somebody who he is, who Wolf is interested in. <laughs> I've yeah. already, I mentioned how I once laid the uh, plot of the poem Aristius over the Book of the Long Sun. I also laid the life of Hephaestus over the Book of the Long Sun. Oh. He basically was responsible for guarding an island. He would just basically run around. He was a, he was a mechanical man, mm-hmm. a, a robot, a bronze man. And one fun thing about Hephaestus, too, is that, of course, you know, Baldander's created Talos, right? That's just, right. just so in case you don't remember that. <laughs> <laughs> just, so, yeah, the big mystery, of course, from the books is that it seems like Talos is the one in charge and Baldander's is the dummy or the servant. But, of course, the reality is just the opposite. Um, but Hephaestus, that means that Baldander's would be close to Hephaestus. And Hephaestus is a god of you know blacksmiths, a god of fire, a god of artificial things. Um, and, and Hephaestus is not in the myths. Hephaestus isn't particularly evil, um, you know, but he's sort of somehow not opposed to the natural world, but he's often seen as more interested in artificial things and creating. Right. And usually that's a good thing, but there is a way that you can take that. And Hephaestus has, especially in like a lot of romantic poetry and romantic iconography um Hephaestus was sometimes later seen as you know sort of a corrupt kind of figure who would sort of take nature and and turn it to improper uses or something like that right um and of course that fits perfectly with bald anders so um one other thing I always have to mention um I am a huge fan of Edmund Spencer's Fairy Queen and there is a character the Talus or Talus in there and it's in book five of the Fairy Queen and Talos is the companion of uh, the, the Knight of Justice who uh, wanders around and has various adventures, but he's this killing machine. Um, he's, he basically, he's sort of like the, the strong arm of justice and he'll go and he'll just, you know, go attack whoever uh, the Knight article has to show his true justice to. He's sort of the, the violence. And it's kind of funny because in the book, what often happens is article, the actual Knight of Justice, is shown sort of making decisions. But when it comes to the actual violence in order to get justice, Talus is the one who goes off and actually produces that violence. Um, and does mm. it. So in other words, it's kind of sometimes like seen as like a narrative way to keep the Knight of Justice looking nice and pure and the weapon guy is the one who goes off and sort of Mm. does the things. But I always have liked that because when you think about Talos, Talos is the one who does a lot of the hard work for bald injuries, right? He's the one who has to, to get him moving. He's the one who has to beat him to get him going. And later on in sort of the Lictor, when we finally get to the castle, Talos is the one who's often connected with destruction 
as the one, the, the sort of circle of destruction and rebirth. Talus is the one who always has to do a lot of the destruction. And they even tell a little story there about basically the Ouroboros again, the snake eating its own mm -hmm. tail, um, which is, that's one thing we'll have to talk about in the book that the Ouroboros shows up right at the end of the Talus and Baldander story too, just like it does in the dream here. But save that for later. <laughs> um, but yeah, so so what Talus is, is sort of that destructive figure. And I, I don't know that Wolf read the Fairy Queen. I'd like to think that he does because oh, I, I love the Fairy, the Fairy Queen, Queen so much. Yeah, I think um, he did. It, so it, I would love to think that he did. I just don't know. But uh, could, do you know other places? Sorry, this is a total tangent here. But when we talked to Nigel, he pointed. He mentioned up, you're right. He mentioned the blatant beast. Yeah, the blatant beast. Right. He's a character in the holding like book. a bell. Yeah. So that would be there. It just he never in all the things I've read, I never noticed any sort of direct mention, other than Talus is pretty straightforward. Um, and but this talus here seems more like the Greek talus than uh, Spencer's talus. So if we're looking for a, an easy kind of connection, that's where it seems like it ought to be. Nonetheless, I like to think that there's a lot of the Spencer talus in Dr. Talus as well. Well, I bet it's not the only one. And I'll tell you that I suspect that the use here of Hesphestus is a little more complicated. Yes. Um, Bald Anders is, is Talus. I mean, is uh, Bald Anders is Hesphestus in that he makes Talus. But ta Hesphestus has two lives. Mm -hmm. He has a life on Mount Olympus, and then he has the life that came before when his, uh, his mother, Hera, grabs him by the foot and throws him into the sea. And so he spends part of his time under the water, yeah, in the underworld, so to speak. And he spends part of his life on Mount Olympus. He comes eventually. He comes back and to Mount Olympus and is rescued. So when I was overlaying the, the life of his Festus over the Book of the Long Sun, I discovered that that division was true in that book as well. Silk takes on all of the acts of his Festus on Mount Olympus in the sky. Auk takes on all of the acts of Hephaestus when he is under the sea in his workshop working away. Hmm. And so I I see some of that here as well. Bald Anders, as we know, he's gonna go, he's gonna be flung from his tower into the sea or dive into the sea, into the underworld. That's where he wants to go. Severian is going to end this story with a lame leg, like just like Hephaestus. So what what can be made of that? I don't know, but I suspect that we're going to see a similar dynamic going on here in the Book of the New Sun with Hephaestus as we had in the Book of the Long Sun. Cool catches. <laughs> Okay, well, there's well, there's a lot more we'll say about Talos, oh, yeah. of course, as time going. goes on, but, <laughs> but we've got we've got story to actually get to here. So um, Talos says he's Doctor Talos and takes his hand, and Severian gives his title too. You know, the journeyman Severian. He throws back the bed coverings and takes Talos's hand. By saying he's a journeyman, Talos knows that he's a member of a guild. So he says, "You wear black, I see. What guild is that?" And Severian says, "It's the Guild of the Torturers." Ah, he cocked his head to one side like a thrush and hopped about to look at me from various angles. You're a tall fellow. That's a shame. But all that sooty stuff is very impressive. It seems that Talos knows that Fulogen means soot. So Varian says... Now, why does he say that's a shame that you're tall? He has a good question. He doesn't say, I guess he thinks he's already got one tall guy. <laughs> maybe he's too tall for the role he has in mind. I don't well, know. That's... Oh, maybe he plans for him to be the autarch. Oh, that and... makes more sense that, that he's thinking about his role in the play immediately. Uh -huh. Yeah. So I was trying to think of something like, oh yeah, you're tall and Bald Anders is tall and that's going to be his tragic fate. That's too big. No, I think it's definitely, he's sizing him up for, and all that sooty stuff being very impressive. He's thinking about how he could be on the stage wearing the costume. Yes, yes yeah. that's right. Severian says, we find it practical. The Oubliette is a dirty place, and Fulgen doesn't show blood stains. Talos assumes he's being darkly ironic. Severian is not. 
ironic. You have humor. That's excellent. There are a few advantages, I tell you, that profit a man more than humor. Humor will draw a crowd. Humor will calm a mob or reassure a nursery school. Humor will get you on and off and pull in a semis like a magnet. When he says get you on and off, he means on and off the stage, of course. It's not a double entendre. Because Talos' first concern <laughs> is the theater. Talos is a homunculus. We actually know nothing about the economy of artificial people in the Commonwealth society, despite Severian having close relationships with at least two of them. Severian doesn't know what Talos is talking about at this point, but at least he's, you know, in friendly spirits. I hope I didn't discommode you. The landlord said I was to sleep here. There was room for another person in the bed. But of course, the only reason he's there is to discommode them. <laughs> no, no, not at all. I never came back. Found a better place to pass the night. I sleep very little, I may as well tell you. I'm a light sleeper too. But I had a good night, an excellent night. What did he do all night? <laughs> I'm never sure. Like I yeah. know he doesn't sleep and is always up doing other things, but I'm always wondering is is that when he's off doing whatever spying <laughs> or whatever they have to do information? Maybe he's off gathering. writing plays, I, I guess. Right. <laughs> Could be. Where are you going this morning, Optimate? Severian puts on his boots and socks too, I suppose, and says that the first thing he'll do is have breakfast and then he'll head north out of the city. Excellent. No doubt my partner would appreciate a breakfast. It will do him a world of good. And we're traveling north and a most successful tour of the city, you know. Going back home now, play the east bank down, playing the west up. Perhaps we'll stop at House Absolute on our way north. That's the dream, you know, in this profession. Play the Autark's Palace or come back if you've already played there. Chrysos by the Hatful. Severian thinks of Thecla. I've met one other person, at least, who dreamed of going back. Don't put on that long face. You must tell me about him sometime. But now, if we're going to go for breakfast, Baldanders, wake up! Come, Baldanders, come! Wake up! He danced to the foot of the bed and grabbed the giant by the ankle. Again, Talos sort of moves like a bird, right? Mm -hmm. Severian starts to reach out to shake him by the shoulder, but Talos warns him away from that. That's risky. He could, you know, rouse and whack you. Talos has probably already made that mistake. <laughs> he says, he thrashes about sometimes. So Talos is yanking his ankle, shouting, bald anders, bald anders. Finally, he stirs. A new day, bald anders, still alive. Time to eat and defecate and make love, all that. Those are all the things that Talos never does. He knows that humans live to do them. Up now, or we'll never get home. They've come down the east side of the Gaio performing. They cross the bridge that Severian crossed, and now they're going north. But Bald Anders doesn't rouse. Talos puts away the blanket. Like I said, his shoulders are over 100 centimeters wide. And that's kind of hunched. His face is buried in the pillow. There are strange scars around his neck and ears. Is that stretch marks? Could be stretch marks. The other thing I always think of, honestly, is Frankenstein scars, um, just because, and the ears remind me of how you always see Frankenstein with bolts, right? right like right mm. under his ears, um, and that his head was sort of put on by someone else. So right. the scars, yeah. Now, now, honestly, stretch marks make more sense. Mm -hmm. um, you know, especially around the neck, like if you're thinking about where he moves or how he would grow, maybe that way. Um, and obviously I don't think Baldanders is literally put together by, you know, different pieces of people like Frankenstein yeah. or the monster. But, um, but I always thought of the scars as like that. When he mentioned the ears, that always made me think of right there. The bolts are right there around his mm. ears, but well, it's, it, it rationalizes a Frankenstein, but yeah. it, but it gives a reason for that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. His hair is grizzled and very thick. His teeth are surprisingly small. Because, yeah, you know, you get, his teeth are normal size. Teeth don't grow. Right. <laughs> they don't grow with the rest of his body. This reminds me of Thecla, by the way. Her teeth were described as narrow in a wide mouth. That's true. So if we assume that the exultant's height is not genetic, her teeth could you know, look that way because they're also not affected by their growth treatments. 
Although Severian can't see his face yet, it's large and coarse, but sensitive and sad as well. I think that must speak of an interesting backstory. Mm -hmm. And I do wish we'd get to know more about Baldander's life earlier. You know, that that would just be fascinating to me to know what what put him on this path, because we never really know that. And we're never really given much of a glimpse. So here we have a hint that Bald Anders has a backstory. Are we supposed to figure it out? I don't know. At this moment, it causes us to sympathize with Talus's poor put upon servant yeah. that he casually brutalizes. Right. But- and that's that's actually one of those points where I kind of feel like we're not supposed to figure out more because what we figure out, or what Wolf kind of comes out and tells us, is the big thing, the big mystery here, or not the the big turn is who's actually the boss and who made who right um and that seems where a point where i'm like is it a puzzle so much about his earlier role i don't i don't know so on with that beating talus is <laughs> talus asks to borrow terminus s but severian refuses even after talus assures him that he doesn't plan to kill baldanders with it still no that wasn't the point. Talos has left his walking stick downstairs. As we've mentioned previously, it's a sword cane. Is there a way that it could be Vodalus's sword cane? Why put two sword canes in the middle, in the same Oh, I know. Story? And I've always wondered that. Um, I have kind of come to the point where I can't figure out any way that Talos would actually get Vold- a, a sword cane from Vodalus, just because those two... I guess you call them subplots, but they never really cross, mm-hmm. right? Um, unless there's there's some place that I, I don't know. But what they do at least do is make some kind of symbolic connection of a weapon that's hidden, something mm-hmm. dangerous that's sort of hidden. Right. And both of those characters do kind of represent something that looks helpful and useful on the outside, or at least, you know, serving some good purpose, but is actually meant to do some mm. pretty bad violence on the inside. So I, I kind of came down to where it's more of a symbolic kind of thing, but I'd love if somebody else has a place where Talos and Baldanders have anything to do with Vodalus, that would be awesome. Cause I've never found any sort of connection between the two. Well, that could be the connection, but then you'd have to right, postulate right. a whole backstory that has them connecting with Vodalus somewhere uh, since in the last year and a half. Baldanders made Vodalus. That is <laughs> Um, apparently custom dictates that people leave their walking sticks in the common room. That seems like a strange requirement. Is Wolf drawing? Especially when he's got a, when he was taking swords up there. Yeah, yeah, when exactly. SS came on up. Yeah. So is Wolf drawing from something real? Talos is afraid it will be stolen. He thinks he should pretend to limp so he can keep it with him all the time. So he starts rummaging around the room. He doesn't find anything that he's looking for. So he goes downstairs and gets his cane. It's made of ironwood and has a gilt brass knob. If it's Vodalus's Severian doesn't seem to recognize it. Talos starts whacking Baldanders on the back with the cane to wake him up. All right, and with the and with the knob, the knob of the cane. Like it's not like he's hitting him right. with the stick start. He's like he's full on whacking him with the head. Exactly. Hand. Yeah. <laughs> Severian describes his blows as being like raindrops on his huge back. Of course, Baldanders is trying to get big, like the Undines. He wants to be like a me- Megatherian. He wants to be a Megatherian or you know, one of their minions. So he's growing himself. Theoretically, mm-hmm. this will make him immortal. I have that right, right? That's yeah. That's what they say, and and you know that kind of gets to something I want to talk about later. But yeah, so Baldanders' form of immortality is continual growth, and right. Um, like the idea, I think, is not that he's going to get to a certain size and stop, but I think the point is that the kind of immortality he's seeking basically requires him just to grow forever. Right. And that's where it starts to get a little crazy. Um, and there's some some ideas that are a little more theoretical, maybe, um, I have about why that might be the case. Well, that's like a cancer, right? You go yeah. get brand new growth, and so you're always young, right? And it also gets back to eating. I mean, in the in the dream, one of the things he says is that right, Abaya is going to consume the continents, right? Right. That he's he's going to grow and grow, and so there's kind of um, you know immortality in that case is requires destruction for kind of selfish purposes, right? And there might be a different kind of immortality where there's a little bit of self destruction so that other things can grow. Exactly. Uh, which and sacrifice, self-sacrifice. Uh, that's a little different. 
that we'll get to. But we're getting into big things yeah. there. <laughs> so we finish up the story. First. But like a baby that has to devote so much energy to growth, yeah. Paul Danders is a deep sleeper. Yeah. Anyway, that's my understanding. Mm-hmm. Um, suddenly, Paul Danders is awake and he sits up quite suddenly. The giant sat up and said, I'm awake, doctor. He looks at Severian, whom he recognizes as a Carnifex, and says, have you decided to kill me at last? And before then, too, I like that the way Severian describes his face. He says his face was large and coarse, but sensitive and sad mm-hmm. as well. Like, that's the first thing. That's the first bit of personality we get about right. Bald Anders, right? Um, that, that's sensitive and sad. And that could be there to kind of make us feel sorry for him, right? But, yeah, so this is the first time we get a little bit of personality for Bald Anders. And I feel like the making him sensitive and sad is probably supposed to make us, you know, on that first time read, you know, feel sorry for him and sort of put us on his side so that Talos seems like the mean, the mean leader. But, but it is an interesting thing too, since it's so different from what Baldanders is eventually going to mean, right? Like Baldanders wow. eventually comes to be not demonic or satanic, but he's, he's sort of like an embodiment of, of a kind of selfish growth and, and um, you know, or, or all sort of blind science or something like that, like all these different things mixed up together which are totally false and wrong. But the first moment we get it here is sadness, right? right. Like it's, and I really like that because it's such a subtle little thing for Wolf to say it that way. But the pity that you feel for this big dumb oaf is actually probably something in the end that he still wants you to feel, you know, a bit of pity for this poor right. guy who is misled in, and, you know, taking the wrong way to last forever to immortality. Exactly. Um, yeah. Yeah, I just like it a lot. It's, it's a tiny thing, but I like it a lot. Talos tells Baldanders that Severian shared his bed, and now he's going to join them for breakfast. Baldanders says that if he slept in his bed, he understands where he got his dreams he was having. Severian asked what dreams he had, and he said, of caverns below where stone teeth drip blood, of arms dismembered found on sanded paths, and things that shook chains in the dark. So, <laughs> <laughs> dang <laughs> yeah okay that's on uh, that's pretty much on point <laughs> and then he brushed his teeth with his finger yeah yeah he said all that yeah he, he he sits on the bed and he spits in the corner and Talos says that they have to get going okay and try to sort through this let's talk about the dreams baldander's dreams come from severian's mind right that's what he seems to suggest yeah yeah. yeah. So for a long time, almost from the beginning, I've believed that Severian's dream was not meant for him, that it was meant for Baldanders, that Severian hijacked Baldanders' dreams. This is how the ministers of uh, Baia reach out to Baldanders. I thought the boy puppet is not Severian, but Baldanders. I thought that because one, I couldn't figure out what the Undyne's motive was in setting this task for him to do to defeat Baldanders when I assumed he was working for them. I figured that this was a, you know, a wolf faint. I I figured the path that Abaya had set for Severian is not to defeat him, but prevent him from going to Yesod. The wooden puppet that, that does that. It, It looks like his mission is to defeat Severian and cause him to fail to achieve the White Fountain, the new sun. Now, I don't believe that anymore. My new understanding of the first Severian makes me realize that that's not how time works in this world. The Undines can't know what Severian will do before he does it. I think this is an actual fight that the first Severian had with Baldanders. I doubt they met in Nessus. But he did find his way to Lake Deaterna, where, to free the tribe's peoples, he assaulted the castle. Uh, the the BFO Kakajins were not there. I'll get to why I think that in a bit. He assaulted Baldander's castle, fought with him, and killed him. And Baldander was wearing his gravity belt and rose, you know, up, 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 just like in the dream. But... When our Severian, this Severian, battles with him, Baldanders doesn't die. He undoes his gravity belt and dives into the sea, never to be seen again. (laughs) Well, 
And that's why this puppet show is different from the events of the Sword of the Lictor. What do you think? Well, if we're going with the first Severian theory on that part, then I think that works. I mean, because it would be one way to explain why things are different or, or why what it shows is a little different. Although I wonder too, I mean, the fact that the actual giant puppet rises up, I mean, the gravity belt does rise up, but I, I might, since it's a dream, I might give him a little leeway if the details aren't exactly right. <laughs> mm. But that does explain or offer one explanation of why those are different. Why yeah. Those two are different. It was a difference that always threw me and, mm -hmm. and I could never put two or two together. I've, at least now I can, I have room to do that. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah. I still feel like the straightforward reading is, yeah, they switched dreams somehow. They dreamed each other's dreams, how that happened and why I'm not exactly sure. But my general sense is that kind of what's going on here is, yeah, they were getting, I don't know, signals <laughs> from yeah. Abaya. Um, and, and, you know, it, it's a temptation thing for Severian. Baldanders is, you know, maybe because he might have some connection to Abaya or, or at least be very sympathetic to Abaya. Maybe that means that he's more open to them. Um, the actual plot mechanics of how people get other people's dreams. I don't know. You know, it's, 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 it's well, okay. I think we get a little picture of how this happens in claw, the conciliator. Someone uses quote, that rarest of all weapons on bald Anders, oh, a true. dream a dream. But what if it's not actually a device that's primarily intended as a weapon? What if this is the equivalent of hitting someone over the head with your laptop? It, it's effective, but it's not using the device as it was intended. Perhaps a dream is primarily a communication device. That seems right, that the idea that it's some kind of communication, something kind of on par with you know, whatever it is that is making Malrubius and Triskel. I kind of feel like this is on par with whatever is uh, creating the Aquasters. You know, it's some kind of, of something like that. In other words, I don't think these are innocent dreams. I don't think these are actually just Severian having some kind of subconscious right. something. No, no, I think that this is... This is, this is, a, that's a pretty clear message, right? Yeah. At the very beginning of the dream, he signals something like that, because remember he says, and then I dreamed though it may have been that bald Andrew's words too were a dream yet. I don't think so. And if they were, it was a different dream, which kind mm -hmm. of means like it's a different kind of dream that something else is going on. Maybe. Uh, yeah. And I feel like that's a little bit of a, of a signal too. I feel like it's, is it a temptation from a bio? Is that what he's being shown? Well, if it's Severian's dream, then it's a temptation. Mm -hmm. um, if it's Baldander's dream, then it's an offer. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I, I mean, that's essentially the same thing, but differently. If Severian is in this dream and they think they're talking to Baldanders, but it's actually Severian. I mean, we don't know what this person in the dream looks like because he doesn't come upon any mirrors. Maybe yeah. in the dream, he's, you know, he looks like bald Anders. Right. But Severian does say, who am I? Right. Exactly. Yeah. And, um, and then it makes the end a little more, it's different, difference from what actually happens makes a little more sense. Cause then you could say that even though bald Anders loses, he, you know, he transcends somehow like the, the figure he might be, he might die in the fight, but he does rise up. He yeah, but he doesn't him. rise. He doesn't rise. Right, in the reality, he doesn't. He falls, he right. descends. Right, and so that's why I mean, like, if if maybe what, if the dream was meant for Baldanders as an offer, oh. maybe what it could be saying is, you know, even if you do have to, you know, have some kind of showdown with something, um, then that could yeah. be, you know, then, then there might still be a good end to it. Possibly. That's one possible way to look at it. Um why should one of one or the other of them be represented as a little wooden twig puppet? I mean, there's a Pinocchio reference in there a little bit, but the the Pinocchio and the real boy. That is true. The Pinocchio and the real boy. And I also feel like um, there, he, the emphasis on the sticks is on how crude it is. Right. And the emphasis with the little boy is how well, well, well made it is. Uh-huh. That, you know, not coming from a but but when I think about what Baldanders actually 
is in the story eventually he is kind of a crude version of what a crude version of immortality a crude version of what a positive future could be like he has some good things he certainly can grow he learns a lot he's a great scientist um but the premise of what he's going is the higher duels will say this isn't really going to go anywhere all it's going to do is make you survive but it's going to destroy everything else and so it seems like it's a false false future it's a bad future whereas the little boy may seem smaller but he's incredibly well crafted mm -hmm. um he's also young he's always young he's not something who's constantly you know getting older and bigger and things like that right. so there's more renewal in the the little boy well um, the twigs it's also a type of it's it's a it's 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 wood it's green man it's he's mm -hmm. alive that's the other thing yeah um and that's what i was wondering too because he even says that it still has some uh some green on it where what's the actual word oh shoot uh his limbs were tree still showing bark and green bud right so yeah there's still a little bit of something growing in him um but not enough it would seem like he's still broken that's kind of how i see it though is more about the crudeness of the the statue um uh but the, the, the trick there is then that doesn't seem like something a bio would want to communicate <laughs> to <Mold -Dater, laughs> because that seems like the opposite meaning yeah you know um, so i get confused again on that point yeah well unless bald Anders is the real boy and it could be like are we seeing that could be another place where we're expecting it to mean one thing and it seems obvious that the boy who severian is still a boy in this point um or it seemed like emotionally still a boy he's going to grow up a lot in the next few months but uh and he has the sword yeah and um so it seems like the obvious connection there would be to make severian be the boy but yeah maybe it is switched does he need to get severian's sword is that a is that a secret motivation of Baldander? It seems it seems unlikely. They leave. He st Severian still has the sword. Yeah, and the sword's never important to them. Like they never try to sell it or anything like that. The only time they ever really want Terminus Est is right there when Talos says, "Let me have it to beat him." Right. But otherwise, they're never really concerned with it. The only the only other thing I did want to say was that that it is fun that we see a play, right? And one thing we know that the puppet show is a drama and it's performed for someone. We're going to see a play, of course, with Dallas. Right. So we do get that sense of things being done for show. Exactly. This story is full of people play acting. We've already been to the House of Azure. The Autark is pretending to be a pimp who's pretending to be the Autar. Mm -hmm. Here we have a puppet show. Talos is running a theater. And Agalus and Agia, when he comes to their, their place, Agalus is wearing a mask, and he seems to be wearing a mask under that mask. Mm -hmm. So it just goes on and on and on. And I don't know if we're supposed to be drawing connections between these things or if it's just a running gag. I, I don't know. So let's one last thing. Talos invites Severian to breakfast. Talos won't reveal his intentions in this invitation until Claw the Conciliator. When we, he first sees Severian in Baldender's bed, he assumed that Severian was sent by the authorities as a warning against their play. Talos's play is overtly anti autarky. He says, mm -hmm at least in appearance, which implies that it actually is not, maybe. That's interesting. Well, let's move on, though. Talos has completely dismissed the idea that a member of the Torturer's Guild would be wandering through Nessus like a vagrant. <laughs> After all, they if they needed to go to Thrax, they could just as easily have afforded to send him by boat, right? Yep. But then Talos reconsidered. No, that would be a ridiculous overreaction. Send a torturer all the way from the Citadel to scare a couple of traveling actors. Notice that Talos knows about the Citadel and the Mannequin Tower and the Torturer's Guild. He's not like most people. So he comes to an alternate theory. Talos Craig is a man after my own heart. He comes to an alternate theory. 
Severian is a spy of some sort. He's trying to travel incognito. Yeah. Now, this theory, for a lot of reasons, I think, Talos must literally have a screw loose in his mechanical head. <laughs> but there it is. Anyway, Talos guess is that Severian is associating himself with them so people won't know he's an agent of the government. He's trying to travel without people seeing him as a government agent by associating himself with anti-government types. Well, as Talos has said, his play is not actually anti-government. Yeah. So Talos decides to assist Severian's mission by writing a role for him that explained why he wears his cloak, which supposedly Severian is trying to remain incognito wearing his cloak. And later at House Absolute, as he sees it, his service to the government is rewarded with a big sack of money. We got that worked out. That is the, there are few theories about this book, few curiositus earthuses that are more convoluted than Talus's own theory about Severian. Yeah. If that's what he believed. Do you have a curiosity to serve this? Well, problem is when I was looking for this one, there are a lot of discussions of the dream, but not more suggestions. Like there aren't a whole lot of people who, apart from saying, yeah, this is sort of like a, the image of the future or something like that. And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> I still don't really know exactly what the dream is. I don't, I, I, I thought I had a much better idea about the dream until I talked to you. Well, I think the problem with the dream for me is trying to figure out where it comes from. Like we've been playing with the idea that it's from Abaya and switched and, and somehow they're dreaming each other's dream a little bit. And that's a really good possible theory. The other thing it could be is remember that Severian, of course, does have all kinds of mess with time. Right. And so he, <laughs> it could simply be that Severian is quote unquote, remembering something from his future. And there's a different way that, that what is going on in the dream is more kind of like warnings of what could happen and, you know, omens of, of what could happen. And you know, so writing on the pterodactyl, you know, he does write a beast later in Citadel of the Autark, um, seeing the earth, uh, flooded like that. Well, that's something that that is an idea that gets put in his head and that later on he will actually see. Um, and he doesn't actually go down with all the Undines to meet them like, like Abaya does, but he certainly gets tempted to that with Juturna later on. Um, and then the puppet show is, you know, like I said, from a broad level is at least, you know, very similar to kind of what happens in when he finally confronts Baldander. So in some ways it could just be foreshadowing of different things that happen. But if that's the case, then why these particular things, right? Like right. what, like I always want to know what is the actual meaning? Like, why did Wolf put this in here for us to see him do <laughs> like, what's the, <laughs> what's, what's the purpose for us and what's the plot? And it certainly does a lot of sort of mood foreshadowing of things that we, you know, start looking for. And it does kind of flesh out a little bit about the monsters that we've heard about with Abaya. We kind of see right. a little bit more about that. But when you, I still have trouble with the dream of actually figuring out exactly in the plot, what it's signifying and even what Wolf exactly wants us to do with it. So I'll admit, I don't have a good answer for what the dream is. I can find all kinds of connections to other things. Of course, we right. just talked about a whole lot, a lot of them, but you know, why exactly at this point um, it connects. I don't really know. I still admit I don't really know. So this is one place where I definitely want to know if other people have much more solid ideas about the purpose of the dream, the role, its role in the story, where it's coming from, why Wolf wanted us to see the dream at this point, you know, what it's supposed to tell us exactly about Severian. Right. Um, I still really like the idea that it's coming from Abaya and and maybe meant to be like an offer for Baldanders, but Severian, you know, psychically I, gets a little bit of it. I exactly. like that a lot. Yeah. But I'm not sure that it's, I don't, I don't know that that's the best way. There must, there may be other ways. The, the, the thing is, is that if the little wooden puppet is Severian and the boy is Baldanders, then there's a whole story 
that we have yet to decipher and unravel about what the intentions of Abaya is. Right. What is? What do they want for Bald Anders? And I have to admit, I don't entirely understand what Bald and Anders' role in this story is. What What are Bald Anders and Talos actually in the story for? I mean, apart from just being a cool you know, a very cool set of characters. Um, I know sometimes people say they're comic relief and Talos might seem like that sometimes, but there's too much, especially when you, you know, the play, how serious that is. And then once you know the big fight at the end of sort of the Lictor, Mm -hmm. they're definitely more than comic relief. So. And he's sinister. Talos is is sinister. The way he, way he he kind of abandons Jalinta on the road there. He entices her into this role that he knows will lead to her death. Yeah. And when he sees, when he's showing Severian around the castle and he sees all these people and the body says, what are these people for? Oh, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, parts, I guess. <laughs> and part of the reason I ask is because, okay, in the dream, it seems like it's setting up as the fight between Severian and Baldanders is a big conflict that has yeah. to get resolved and the way that it ends sort of the lictor is almost saying you know from a sort of structural standpoint that that's a big showdown between severian and an antagonist but mm-hmm. why is baldanders pitted against severian um like that's just a question that we should i feel like we should ask and that would be good to have to have in the back of our minds as we think about baldanders um so if we're thinking about their role in the book, I mean, the one thing that I think is the biggest clue is that the BFO guys, <laughs> which I kind of like just saying it, that <laughs> the, 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 the duels are, it seems like initially helping Baldanders and then they switch as if mm-hmm. to say Baldanders was going to be the one who might help bring about the new son, but then they switched to Severian. Is that what you think is going on there? That Sever- that Baldanders was like an alternate path that they I, were trying? I think they even say that in the, in the castle, that he was originally considered a potential candidate for the new son and that that's mm-hmm. why they're helping him. And now they see him as something different. They see him like a tree root that cracks a, a cliff or something like that. And then life can come out of that out of the cracking of the rocks. Mm-hmm. Um, he, he's basically, he creates something, he doesn't benefit from it, but other things can come along and benefit from it. So I think they're talking about his technology mm-hmm. that he creates. Okay. So then why does Severian have to have a showdown with him? Like, why is he presented as something that Severian would have to destroy? Um, is it because he represents a kind of selfishness? You know, I'm thinking a little bit more on a kind of allegorical level here, but mm-hmm. is it because Bald Anders is, is Severian, or as Talus says, that other people, you know, may experiment on themselves in order to apply what they learn to the world, whereas Bald Anders is so self-absorbed that he experiments on the world in order to improve himself. Mm. And it's so it's very selfish. Bald Anders wouldn't really be worried about humanity as much as he is worried about Baldanders. Um, is that what makes him, you know, in line with Abaya and the other Undines because he's a giant and they're the giants or whatever reason, they're more about something, I guess, selfish or, or, or just something that doesn't help the race as a whole. Is that kind of why Baldanders is opposed to Severian? Well, I honestly, I, I used to believe that he was very, closely linked with Abaya. And now I don't, I don't think he's, I, I, yeah. I seriously, I didn't mention this to you. I seriously suspect he's not political at all. Right. And I, I agree with that. Like, I don't think he's in line with that. I just, it's sort of the size the fact that he's growing, that kind of yeah. puts him, he wants you know, to be analogously them. like, right? them. yeah. Yeah. So. He's that's how, that's how he plans to live forever is you just keep growing and growing and growing like a cancer. Yeah. Um, but why, does he have to be Severian's nemesis? In fact, it, it's almost like their fight is predetermined. And Severian does lead a revolution that needs to happen. The people are really suffering under this monster that lives up on a, on a cliff. And in that sense, Severian does rescue them. 
I think what's most important, what's most intriguing to me, and sorry, but this this first Severian question can answers so many puzzles. It get, provides me the ability to answer them. I can't guarantee that they is the answer, but it provides me the ability to answer them. And that is, you know, when in Earth of the New Sun, Severian goes and he meets BFO for the last time for him. And for them, it's the first time. And then later, he meets them for the first time again. Mm -hmm. And you have to think of this whole idea that when you change something, you don't overwrite your own time. You create a new time. You create new people. And so I, right now, my working theory is that BFO go back in time to encounter Bald Andrews because they think he's a candidate for the new son. And that's why they help him. And then Severian, for Severian, goes to Yesod, get, achieves the new son. Now, BFO, they have a different opinion. They don't, they're, they have a different opinion of Baldanders. They have a different opinion of Severian. Now they go back, not to meet Baldanders, but to encounter Severian. And Baldanders has still received help from the first BFOs who've gone out. And now what we're seeing here is the second BFO. And they're the ones who have come basically as pilgrims to meet Severian. Hmm. Yeah, that's getting that's the the timey wimey stuff is getting complicated. But, but that actually kind of <laughs> I know, no, but I if mean, you see the new sun, it gets just like that. Yeah, it does yeah. get very complicated. But I I think that might make a little sense too. Huh. Okay. Um but that that would be one one way to kind of see how that works with with what they're signaling. I guess and I'm still kind of wondering though, just in general, like why what does Baldanders what do Baldanders and Talus represent? like to wolf in in this world like if severian is eventually you know at least on the path to becoming a savior and so there's something about what severian does that's right what what is it that baldanders does that's wrong well is, there's a you know there's a story by um why is his name george mcdonald mm -hmm. um called son of the day daughter of the night and the way it starts out is there's this witch and she's, and the, th the thing, what he explains is that witches, the thing you always have to know about witches is they are really interested in everything, but they really don't care about the things they're interested in. Mm -hmm. And th that there it's, is kind of a, a statement on science without yeah. ethics. And that's kind of what bald Anders is, but bald Anders is science without ethics. It could Does, be. You know, that's the so there's all these solutions for for Earth's suffering that, you know, if we could just get back to the stars, if we could just not be so backwards, which is, you know, that's they basically engineered a backwardness on Earth for at least for the Commonwealth. Mm -hmm. And but it, Wolf might be saying, you know, that's not necessarily the solution at all. So that could be there is another way of looking at it that I'm wondering about because it, it struck me the end of the dream it being a puppet show that a puppet show would be one way to show that this conflict between severian and baldanders you know is a way to sort of just Manipulate in a fun it. way show it but also that they're being that their conflict is a manipulation mm -hmm. right that 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 if, if you're showing something as a puppet show and as theater then you're saying hey this is false and there are other people literally pulling the strings so then who is manipulating them would be the question yeah. Um, is that almost like the one thing that I thought was that it could be Abaya saying, hey, Severian, you're being manipulated by some other creatures, the Hyroduals, to fight this guy, whereas you should, you know, come with me and you can be your own master. And maybe that idea of being your own master, which is kind of like Baldanders, that's another version of the thing that Severian is supposed to represent because, you know, of course, as, as what happens when he... Um, has all of his revelations and citadels, he decides to, you know, obey and, and what the feeling that he, he has of, of his destiny or his purpose or something like that, and basically becomes or tries to become less selfish than he had been. So you could, you could have that, that possible reading there that what the saying it's a puppet show is doing is emphasizing 
that Severian is being manipulated and Abayas may be trying to signal to him that he's being manipulated. But I guess in the end, Severian wouldn't see that as manipulation in the same way. Well, um, okay, let me theorize against the first Severian theory. Mm-hmm. What if the Baldanders is a potential candidate, or as he was originally, for the new son? Mm-hmm. And Abaya and the Undines are conspiring to get him to kill Baldanders because of that. Hmm. That could be because they're afraid maybe that Baldanders is eventually going to be stronger than him, than they are. Yeah, or that, the that they think he's going to bring the new son. Oh, hmm. that's interesting. Because the, the Undines do say, I mean, Jaterna does say that they've always been watching Baldanders, right? That they follow him. And that's actually why they find Severian again, because she was looking for Baldanders or following mm-hmm. him. And then all of a sudden they get back together. So, yeah, so they're either trying to stop Baldanders or they're certain or they want to try and get him on their side or something but they recognize that he's got these powers well if they're I mean they can't be wanting to get Baldanders on their side they're if they're setting Severian up on a mission to kill him to kill him unless it's sort of like multiple things they either want him for their side or they want him dead one of the yeah. other yeah. yeah but no so just the fact that it's a play makes me think that in a puppet show in particular yeah it definitely feels like it's some sort of a Manipul- it's also like it's signaling manipulation. Mm-hmm. I I got to confess that the the puppet show motif never it does not make me uh, comfortable. It never made me comfortable. I don't. I, I do feel like it means something, and I don't know what it means. Well, everything with Talos and Baldanders is all cut up with drama. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's there's the that that puppet show. Of course, there's the play. They call themselves traveling actors. They're each they're pretending to be a different part you know, form of the relationship that Talos is pretending to be the boss and Baldanders is pretending to be the slave. So they're always pretending to be something that they're not and they're all wrapped up with it. But then at the same time, Talos's play tells the truth about yeah. a lot of things. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, and, and so does, so does the Undines play, right? The Undines show exactly almost what happens. I just, everything about Baldanders and Talos starts to make sense by the end except for the involvement of the undines. I don't understand how they're what how they're playing this game. Yeah. So anyway, I wanted to bring that up because that's uh, honestly the Baldanders and Talus's role in the book has always been something that I couldn't pin down. Mm-hmm. Um just it, exactly like and I and maybe it's because sometimes I try to to treat it too much treat the book too much like an allegory. <laughs> where, where in the end, everyone kind of has a certain role to play in the larger sort of cosmic story that's going on. I think that's a, that's but, off, that's not a bad way of of viewing Wolf's story. Often, yeah. Um, there's he's off he's often following hidden paths, and he, you know he has his own reasons for for um, juxtapositioning people the way they yeah. he does. Yeah. So that doesn't make sense. It, it does make sense. You would want that there's some reason why Severian and Baldenders have to be structurally opposed to each other. Yeah. And it's not, it, you're right. It's not obvious when they have their fight at the end. It's almost like, uh, like a drunken fight at a bar or something. Oh, you <laughs> insulted my stone. And um, first he comes, yeah. because first he comes in to, to rescue all the people. And then when he gets in there, he sees the aliens and he almost forgets about that. And, and then, oh, well, we got to, I came here to fight. I'm going to fight. So, yeah. Yeah. It's like, it, it makes sense to me on a sort of macro level. But then when I try and get the details of the, the story and, and what we learned about Baldanders and Talos to actually match that, it just seems like they're doing their own thing so much yeah. that it's, it's hard. It's just hard to, <laughs> to figure out how they go together. I may have, once we talk about the play, that's one thing I really want to think about is not just what's going on with the play, but how does... Like, what purpose does the play serve for Talos to be telling that story? Yeah. Well, he says that it's ostensibly uh, against the autarky, uh, but which suggests that it's not really, that maybe he's kind of work, thinks he's working with the autark. I don't know. Mm -hmm. He's not working, he's not working with Vodalus. He's obviously, he's not with Vodalus. 
there's no real evidence in the conversation with BFO that he has any interest in the Megatherians or their plots. He just really comes off as so non-political. He's just a, 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 you know, he's a predator. But that's one thing. When we get to the play, I want to think about that because I think most of the time in the commentary, people look at the play more as like, oh, if you read this, it's sort of a clue as to what's going on in the bigger story. But that, to me, doesn't seem like how Wolf would be working. Like, he would have the play be Talus trying to do something or try and mm. make the story fit a certain type of uh, agenda, basically. Like, like I can't, I can't imagine that Wolf would just say, okay, and this guy happens to tell a story that's going to explain the real thing of what's going on. <laughs> well, why Talus? Why would it be Talus who's doing that? Because, honestly the real story of what's going on behind, if it is about bringing the new sun, that's not really something that Talos and Baldanders seem like they would be necessarily interested no, in. He does I have, don't know. They, they do have, we do find out they have interaction with the Herodules, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. There, there's pieces and strings I need to figure out how to put together in a better yeah. way. No, so, no, but let's face it. There's so much about Talos that is still a mystery. It's that, yeah, that fox face, the and, wily the wall, fox, the stuffed fox on the wall, yeah. and and how he talks about how he brings that up with the introduction of all of these ancient uh, artifacts that are still existing in the world today, and mm -hmm. yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, important things to think about that we'll come back to. Yay. More often than not. Oh, bald enders. <laughs> all right. Well, there's a lot there. So that, that one, that one, we we got even more speculative than usual. I feel like in some ways, without help from, uh, we didn't have any uh, uh, curiosity. Curiosity Earthus Earthus. Earthus. Time, so. Yes. All right. Well, that was something, <laughs> and <laughs> it's a hard one. Yeah. Please, people, please contact us about this on Facebook it, on the Facebook group, the Rereading Wolf Facebook group, or on Reddit for Rereading Wolf Podcast, on Instagram, on email, rereadingwolf at gmail.com. Well, I think I think I need some help on this one. So I'm <laughs> Yep, I think we could both use more input on this one. Speaking of Instagram, by the way, it's fun. Uh James is finding a lot of really cool covers of books honestly some i've never seen before so i keep i keep seeing ones on there that you'll come up with and i'll be like i thought i'd seen things but that one obviously i'd never known so different international covers and versions that i didn't even know existed so it's fun, <laughs> fun stuff on instagram also if you do like the show it always makes us feel good if we get a review on apple podcasts mm -hmm. uh, even if it's just a little stars but if you want to say something too it's always just fun to see that on there <laughs> Especially since there are at the moment only three Wolf podcasts out there. <laughs> I think if you search for Gene Wolf, it's not like we're going to be lost on the second page, I don't think. <laughs> no, no. This is all part of my goal to be able to call the other podcasts cute little niche podcasts. <laughs> Just kidding. No. <laughs> but, but not. Um, but, <laughs> <laughs> but no, so thanks so much for listening. Get in touch with us and we will respond on the various social media sites, but also talk about it. Absolutely. On the show. So thank you for listening. And next time we'll be back with a strange breakfast. Yes. Thanks, everybody. Oh, McDonald had a pterodactyl. E -I -E -I -O. calls it the World River Ouroboros. Or Ouroboros. Let me try that again. Ouroboros. Um, oh, shoot. My dog's going crazy. <laughs> Crap. Hold on. Hold on one second. Yeah.